We are Embrace the Suck 21 if you're new yes, here. Yes, we are. I'm Spencer. And I'm Daniel. This week we are celebrating 100,000 subscribers. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, we are going all the way back to our humble beginnings. Get your bingo cards out, y'all. Yeah. This is the channel that Oasis built. 100%. While there's not too many stones we have not overturned when it comes to Oasis and the Gallagher brothers in general, every now and again, something pops up. And this is Noel Gallagher guitars and gear interview on that pedal show. Awesome. This is <laughs> this is their most viewed video. Like, it's at 1 million at the time of this recording. Wow. Yeah. When did it come out? It's a recent one, actually, I think. Oh, wow. that's a month ago. Okay, a cool. A month ago that this came Damn. out. This is uh, right around the time that Council Skies came out. Oh, and got it, got it. Okay, we did that. We reviewed that. Yeah, yeah. And let's just say we may have been a little harsh on that review. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, you know, I'm not trying to be harsh. I just think that I like my little Oasis sound. I like that. Mm, yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, stars sound. yeah, obviously, like it gets tiring doing the same thing over and over again. Does it? Looking at you, <laughs> this, all those, Does I only it? come here for one thing, people. <laughs> oh, man. Idiots. But Let's yeah, like he, it. he's not owed anybody anything. He's no. made some of the greatest rock songs of yeah. all time. And like we, we were talking just in private the other day. Oasis was the last great rock and roll band. And like Wonderwall is one of the last rock standards of all yeah. time. You know, at least the, of, of the modern rock era. Radio rock. There you go. Yeah, rock and That's roll, basically. Yep. Some of them just have grown on me because my algorithms are now feeding me Oasis content. More of the High Flying Bird stuff has Got popped it. up. And a few of the songs are starting to grow on me so it wasn't as bad as we thought it was okay okay i will take your word for it there we go <laughs> <laughs> all right and again celebrating 100,000 subscribers this week the five niches that got us there motorsports stick and ball sport comedy yeah. history and music so, oasis just basically oasis british rock without further ado why don't, why don't we get into it let's do it man i'm ready three two one Hey everyone, welcome to that pedal show. Dan here. Mick here. Noel here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, what an absolute uh, honor and treat. Uh, we are in Lone Star Studios, Noel Studio in London. And nice. uh, we're gonna hang out and talk guitars and make some noise and pedals and, and everything. Mate, thank you so much for doing Wow, this, this, I heard that Noel during the pandemic built his own studio in his house. Wow. So this, I guess we're we're doing the interview from his, his studio, house? his that's house. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, okay. That's, that's a different amazing. level. That's a different level, man. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's like he's a guest on their show. That's in his house. So technically, they're guests. And they're that's just bringing wow. his show to him and doing it from there. <laughs> I love that's, that. That's gonna be awesome, man. Come on now. Doing. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm a. Uh, I'm a fan of the show, obviously, and uh, yeah, I've known you for a bit. And uh, yeah, we all said just come down to the studio and check it out. It's yeah. uh, it's a uh, it's a great. Well, all people that have their own studios, well, you know, it's an amazing privilege to have your own studio, particularly in London. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, this place took quite a while to build, but it is honestly, it's truly amazing. It's, it's one of my beautiful. favorite places to hang out. But it's great. But no, thanks for coming. Oh man, 
kidding. We're am amid the uh, the hum and throb of some awesome amps that you'll hear in a minute. Um, so comforting. Noel's been setting up and playing some uh, tones while we've been getting going. Dan and I have been stood in the control room, kind of just checking ourselves a little second there. <laughs> <laughs> you're playing rock and roll style, you're yeah. playing all kinds of tunes and riffs, and we're it's far out. But um, I think we should start with guitars, Noel. Can we mm. do that? Yeah, of course. Um, can we rewind all the way back to the guitar behind the door in the kitchen? Yeah, I'm not, it was, it, it, uh, so, for, I don't know why it ended up there. I don't, my dad never played it. And, I, and he wasn't a guitarist, he was a, he was a DJ. I can only assume that he'd either won it at a game of cards or he'd had designs of, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And uh, it was blonde and it had a hummingbird on it. I don't know whether it was a Gibson, I have no idea. But that guitar, yeah, it kick-started everything, really. Wow. Um, you know, it was... I, I used to get grounded a lot because I was a bit of a difficult child. But, um, <laughs> and I used to take it upstairs and play along to Joy Division bass lines is how I learned how to... I used to play one string at a time and play Love Will Tear Us Apart and all those great Peter Hook melodic bass lines. And then uh, there, was a, there was a guy who knew a guy you know, who smelt of petunia oil, <laughs> right? And uh, I had no concept of a, the tuning of a guitar. And this guy came around and he tuned it up. And it was like, oh, what do I do now? And, uh, and you know, I think the first thing I ever learned to play in it was House of the Rising Sun. Right? Oh. And, um, yeah, it was, just a, it was just a total escape for me from what was a pretty difficult childhood was you could get, and still to this day, you know, I kind of, you know yourself, you can just get, in, you can pass a couple of hours yeah. in, a, in, a, in the blink of an eye, yeah. just noodling around. I will say some of the best gigs I've ever done have been in my front room where it's just thinking, God, I'm fucking brilliant at this. Just <laughs> if only I could do it in front of all those people. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been one of the great, the great uh, accidental uh, privileges of my life is to, you know, be into it, you know, mm. and, and, the, the more, and, and the, the more guitarists you speak to, it's like the obsession of the way they look and all that yeah. was my thing, you know. Um, but no, I, that, 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 that guitar, Lord knows where it is or where it ended up, but wow. yeah, what a thing, yeah, it's like Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite mad walking in here today. Yeah, that's just, it's, I love when talking with other musicians, other guitar players, like when you really get to know someone, you start to talk about what your first guitar was, what your, uh, what what the first song you learned how to play. That that's mm. that stuff's fascinating to me personally. And do you mind if I tell my Go uh, story? Go ahead. Of Go for it, man. So my first guitar was bought from. Uh, it was a gift from my nana and papa. They got it from this uh, pawn shop in Madison, North Carolina. And it just sat in my room for many, uh, a couple of years. Like, uh, this is freshman year of high school. And it wasn't until junior year of high school when something really bad happened, like, that really changed my life. And I won't go into too many details about it. That happened in high school. And I just, I just needed to get it out somehow. And I've been looking at guitar books and how to uh, play. And, you know, I just got this blues riff I started putting words through. I was like, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you write songs. And then I started learning, you know, actual chords with it. Um, you know, I think the first song I learned how to play was, I think it was uh, Time of Your Life, Green Day. That's just, you know, four chords right there. And it was like, it was like a Yamaha acoustic guitar. And I don't know where it is. I don't know. I, I have no idea where it is. Mm. So mm. that's, no man, that's awesome. I mean, it just it just makes sense, you know that like sometimes everything gets so busy, and and um, an instrument like that will will kind of you have to block everything out to give it undivided attention. You know, and it's it's not yeah. hard to block it out. Like it just happens naturally. So like yeah, I I can I can spend a lot of time you know just noodling around and you know well you know yeah what I'm saying is like it's an escape. It's an escape. Yeah. Like you're doing it, and you have to focus on your fingers positioning, your 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 thoughts. You know, you're not you're not part of our world anymore. You're gone. 
Right, right. I, I, I think the the phrasing you have to focus like that's uh, that's not really the right term I would use. It's just uh, you just happen to focus. It just it just it's kind of a calling to Got you. It. It's really like a zone. Yeah, it's it's a zone that you enter. It's not like you're not thinking about it. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's Got that's it. the only thing I'm I'm saying here. But when you're when you're learning, you definitely have to focus, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. At the, the beginning part, you definitely yeah. have to focus and you know be sure your figures are in the right place. Yeah, um, and and know. that's kind of what I was thinking. Like I can envision him as a kid. Sorry, if I, that was loud. You can envision him as a as a kid being a, a troubled a troubled child, troubled being in trouble a lot. Yeah, and yeah, that um, kind of range reels your. Uh, pulls in the reins and makes you sit down and focus. And that is all because of passion. You know? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't and like you're forced to learn this instrument. Right. Out, right. Out you're not forced to learn it. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, that kind of culture. Uh, and I, I had a lot of time in my, my bedroom in a, uh, when I lived up in Northern Virginia, cause you know, it was, mm -hmm. I was always a very shy kid. I was, uh, I mean, the only thing I really got into was like choir and theater. But then again, after I did my homework, uh, it was, you know, uh, with the guitar and that, that became an escape for me. So, so I relate to this a mm. lot and the whole part about being grounded, like learned a lot from the Oasis supersonic documentary that Gallagher boys weren't really the, uh, most pristine, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, very people. True. Very true. Yeah, yeah, man, this is interesting, man. I like this window we're looking through. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're about. To, it's just gonna get juicy. We're only yeah. we're not even five minutes in. Man, to see this Marshall valve state and the Wem underneath. Nice. So uh, watching some of those rehearsal tapes from the early days of Oasis, mm -hmm. you're down there with this, this with, the, that with the space echo on top. Actually, I haven't played. I haven't played those two for thirty years. Right? Wow. And I, so I, I knew I still had it. And uh, I've got the guitars, obviously. And I've got the space echo, sadly, because that was a big part of the sound. Yeah. We'd go into the front of the space echo and just turn the, the preamp up full. And uh, so we've got down there, and the WEM at the bottom, the markings are still on it, and the bass the treble is on full, right? Which is insane. And uh, oh. and, I took, and I plugged it in there and just played the cigarettes and alcohol. I was like, my God, that's, that's the sound. <laughs> that is the sound of Oasis. Is all that hiss on the track? That or Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's that and it being driven compressed on the desk. Right. Um but we, yeah, we found we found some outtakes recently of definitely maybe sessions and it's all it's before the track starts this is what it sounds like. But um I hear. It was never a great there wasn't no big concept behind that sound. The when I bought there was a place in Manchester called Johnny Roadhouse. Anyone that knows the Manchester uh, music shops. Johnny Roadhouse was amazing. Everything was fifty quid. Everything. <laughs> nice. And uh, I'd have bought that for fifty quid, you know. And um, the uh, the Marshall, I think I got when I thought must have come into money somehow. And you know the um, Led Zeppelin and the Pistols and all that kind of thing. And the two of them together actually just sound. I mean, it sounds amazing. That's that was the live the live rig uh until the royalties came in you know but um those whems i mean wow why two amps i don't know i think i found the marshall a bit thin sounding right and i don't know it might have been my it might have been my sound engineer at the time mark coyle who ended up producing yeah. definitely maybe with us i don't know because i'd never seen anybody use two amps it wasn't a thing and marshall and whems don't particularly go together Somebody would have said try them both together, and uh, that would have been just I don't, everything about Oasis at that time was all just accidental. We were just a bunch of guys in a rehearsal room playing, and that's what it sounded like, and that's what we were trying. We never messed with it really, you know. It would be way later down the line that I would get a pedal board. You know, and it was like a pedal board. What are those for? You know, it's like put pedals on. I was like, what do they do? You know, and the only pedal I was the space echo, and, and I got this like a, an on-off switch to kick the delay in, and that was it. But I don't know why economics back in the day when you're skin and you know, you, and you don't know any better. You know, you just 
whatever sounds great, you know. So it would have been that, really. I guess we'll get into more of that as we go on, but the two amps thing has remained a, a theme, hasn't it? Yeah. It's throughout. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, now, now I'm wise enough to have two of the same amps, <laughs> you know, but there is something about when I was mixing Voxes and Marshalls, uh, I've got here a Vox AC50 head that was did all the live things from when we became really huge through a Marshall cab. And, and, and again, it wasn't like some huge concept, but it was just like, well, just try it through that Marshall and I go, oh, that sounds great. Yeah. And um, I would always have on top of it or beside it, like the Blues Junior. For some reason, when you're mixing fat things with more direct things, it kind of worked for me. <laughs> But then I realized many years later, it's because I never stood in front of it. <laughs> so I'd be standing here and that amp would be over there somewhere. And I remember one day I did stand in front of it and go, what the fuck's that? Um, but uh, yeah, there is, there is so, you know, like when you get, when you're playing big places, you can really push it, right. the volume thing. You know, like, oh, you start off in small little clubs and rehearsal rooms and it's kind of, now I think, a lot of equipment is tailored for every conceivable situation right. a band could find themselves in. Yeah. You know, you don't, even have, you don't even have to have an amp, you can have an interface now and a thing and it simulates it all. But yep. back then, you know, it was kind of, you have small amps because you have a small rehearsal room, but remember we got to arenas and the Marshall just wasn't, it wasn't good enough anymore. So yeah. we just you'd start pushing it, stacking things. And um, there's nothing quite like the sound of that rig in an arena. There's nothing quite like it. Stadiums are another thing, but the arena guitar sound is one of my favorite ever rock sounds ever. And I used to love sound checks. I could start a sound check for hours just fucking around jamming and, you know, with the band. And it would just sound incredible. This massive 10, 12,000 space with nobody in it. Just the best thing ever. Like Wembley Arena or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wembley Arena sounds great. Wembley Stadium sounds great, but the, yeah, most of the arenas, the O2 not the O2 is a little bit too big. But when you get those small ones, ten, twelve thousand, that's amazing. But I, I think we're talking about Keeley did this pedal, that, that that reverb pedal, the red one, the thirty millisecond. Oh yeah, yeah. Thing. Oh, the double one, yeah. Yeah, and it's got this reverb there, and I, I don't know, but it sounds like you're in an arena playing. It's got this kind of slight delay on it from the reverb. It's amazing. But I used to love the the, the arena sound. Particularly when you've got a big, a big, a big rig, brilliant. Not great for the singer. Mm -mm. Can we take a trip down memory lane then? <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot to unpack from this uh, last one. Um, definitely, like the Marshall and the Rem amps. Like Marshall, like uh, that's like Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page, uh, Sex Pistols. That's uh that they they that's the sound of them and then vox that's you know the beatles uh john Lennon, george harrison and also uh the edge along with a, a billion different pedals uh make up his sound um like that's that's just interesting to to hear where he got the uh the oasis tone from and because you know it's very it's very like chords and just a very thick wall of sound, mm -hmm. like definitely maybe, and like all the rock forward uh, ones are just really, it, it's great to know where that sound come from. And I will say on my own, my last record I did in 2019, Songs About Nothing, uh, the guitar solos were done through that uh, Vox AC uh, 50. And if, if you'll, if, if you if you listen close enough, if you got an ear trained for it, you'll hear that that Vox sound from it. I mean, obviously the, the my my producer John Brooks, uh, he's had all the you know gear and all that stuff, and uh, I was able to put it through a few uh, um, what do you call it um, emulators uh, to to get certain tones like uh, delay. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a few delay pedals too, but he could he could fix a lot of it with uh, Pro Tools, and not like the old school days of, um, you know, just whatever sounds great sounds great. And then yeah. I don't, I don't really nerd out about it too much. I mean, what I have right now, right back here, is a. Let me see if I can put that away right now. 
It's just a, a Line 6 Spider amp, and it has all these uh, presets on it. And the, I have one pedal, and that's a, uh, I think it's from like Third Man Records, and it has uh, delay, uh, distortion, and uh, reverb on it. And mm. that's really all you need for to, to get a lot of different types of sounds out of it. Now, is it, uh, since I know absolutely nothing about the technical side of anything, um, yeah. why, so it was, was it groundbreaking that they mixed brands? Because, I mean, uh, I, or is it like, I, it, it, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying I'm to say. Sh- it's I'm not sure if it's groundbreaking mixing of amps, but, you know, it's a good way to get different types of sounds and something that really is your own uh, tone back, you know, the nineties when you didn't Got have it. emulators and, and no probably a good point. It's like a lot of times you don't need a physical amplifier anymore, uh, which you just get an emulator to go through the, uh, the sound system. Um, but you know, it, it kind of also it democratizes it and also kind of, there's a little something missing from it because there's nothing that beats the sound of a, you know, live amp, like especially like a Marshall or a Vox or a, an Orange, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, yeah. So I, I had somewhere I was going with that, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. We have an hour left. More than that. Yeah. So. More than that. So we we're we're gonna be talking about this for a little bit. Hell yeah. <laughs> and have a listen to yeah. this. Yeah, uh, which one I listen to first? Let's let's well, go with the Marshall and the Wham. And um, are you sure you want to sit there? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's amazing. It's amazing. It's be amazing. Um, mix around somewhere. Noel's tech. Actually, this cause. And of course, it's a Les Paul. Well, this Les Paul. Now, let me tell you about this Les Paul. Um, so, we were recording. Definitely. What else do you need? Uh, nothing. I've got it now. Can't Oh yeah, just the Marshall and the Wham. We were recording uh, definitely maybe the first attempt I in Mono Valley. Can pass me a blue pick off the back? Yeah, that's one there no. Left there. Um the first attempt at, <laughs> Whoa! Uh, the first <laughs> the first attempt I in Mono Valley in Wales. And um, and I had an Epiphone Les Paul, right? Because I couldn't afford a real one. I wasn't really into I was into the look of Les Pauls, but I didn't, the Beatles played Epiphones, that was good enough for yeah, me. Right. Right. Anyway, so I'd known Johnny Marr for a few years at this point, maybe two or three years, and he sent some guitars down to record this. He sent this, I'll never forget it. He just sends this black and white Rickenbacker, right? That's Ooh. just in a just in a shitty case. And I'm looking at it. And I and I know it's. I'm going. Surely he's not fucking mad enough <laughs> to send down the Smiths guitar to a load of scallies from a council estate in South Manchester. Turns out he is that mad, right? <laughs> and he says, "I've sent you this. I've sent you this. I've sent you a real Les Paul." And I'm like, "Great." I took this guitar out of the case one night, and the first thing I played in the bedroom was, was what became Slide Away. Ah, right. Just like that. Let's go and play that proper these things. Wow. This guitar, it turns out, so I'm like, I fall in love with this guitar and I love the way it looked. And he said, we well, can have it, just like that. And I was like, and it was only years later, he got it off Pete Townsend, All right? And I remember some, something got damaged on this guitar and I took it into a guitar shop in New York and they had to take the neck off. And when I went back to pick it up, the guy said, where have you got that guitar from? And I was like, oh. and he said, the neck doesn't belong to the body. Right? And I was like, right. And, he's, and I was like thinking, oh, Townsend smashed it up probably, do you know what I mean? So there's like a, it's a Frankenstein of a guitar. Anyway, I'm talking to Johnny and I'm like, that guitar, what? Oh, tell me about that guitar. I got it off Pete Townsend. He wrote Panic on this guitar. Right? No way! This is a Smith's guitar. And at that point, I was like, you fucking ain't getting that back. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote Slide Away on it, right? And I used it on all of the Definitely Maybe recordings. And I used it for years. Have you? It's got a really, really funny thin neck. I don't know. 
you'll be more it's got the flattest oh, wow. now the, the neck is something i don't know what the neck is doesn't match the body anyway and it, it's like a it's like a i don't know whether it's a fit i'm not sure well, the, the, the logo down the headstock usually means it's an earlier one that's what you thought isn't it simon simon's with us today um maybe a 53 conversion or something but um yeah that is that's maybe it's been slimmed down over yeah, the years or something well there's well yeah i mean there's no lacquer taken off the back of it but yeah but I'm loving this so much right now, oh, man. Uh, like the the story of how like Johnny Marr got it from Pete Townsend, like that blew my freaking mind. It, it, it it's like everyone's connected, aren't they? Every yeah. every every everyone's fucking connected, man. Yeah, yeah, and he wow. wrote "Slide Away" on that. That's my favorite Oasis song, and mm. like. And for the record, yeah, there's going to be people that are going to shit on me for my take on the Smiths. But I love Johnny Marr. Morrissey can suck a left nut. <laughs> Let's just leave that there. <laughs> I realized last night I was doing a bit of on YouTube looking at, I thought I'd better take in Marshall Valve to see what, I didn't realize it's a metal amp. Uh, when it came out, music, it, yeah. it was a metal high gain amp, which if I'd have known that at the time, I'd have never gone near it. <laughs> right. But it it was such a it complemented that WEM yeah. so much. It was kind of like that would have been the WEM, if I think about it now, would have maybe been too retro and that made it sound a bit more modern and in your face. And the way they're coupling together, that bottom end is yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you just if you just not the Marshall. Could I turn the Marshall down? Yeah, yeah. Turn it back up again. Yeah. yeah. So here's no Marshall. defined in your face yeah it's like there's no fucking around with that sound mm -hmm. and it was why i guess we never use pedals not one of us they're over all all the sounds of the the dirt are all from the amplifiers yeah. wow. i don't I, I remember doing definitely made we never had one single pedal apart from the 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 um the space echo because that was the sound of our rehearsal room, right? You know, but this guitar, I have to say, is, you know, I mean, I'd love to know what Townsend did. I'm not, I'm not sure. It's like a, a it would have been like a '70s one or something. But it's just the most amazing thing. It's the best looking Les Paul I think I've ever seen, and uh, it's got a neck that fits my. I've got, I've only got little hands for a guitarist, but when I told Johnny that I, 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 lit, I mean, the night I rocked Sideway was insane night i remember being up in the bedroom in, in the studio in mono valley and just putting a drink down and i was on the i took it out of the case and I was like wow it's beautiful and i literally wrote slide away not the words obviously but the entire kind of structure of it <laughs> I remember telling johnny he was like because i don't know if you're one of the, i'm one of those people that that think 
that there's music in these things right. and you've just got to get it out. So ordinarily when I'm, if I'm at home and I've got a guitar at home and I haven't written anything on it for a while, it served its purpose like to, go, to go and get another one and something will happen, you know. Oh. And I, you know, Slide Away was in there and, uh, but you know, there's not a day goes by that I don't give thanks and praise to Johnny. For, for giving me this guitar as a dude. Because <laughs> that was a pivotal moment for you. You say the songs just started coming and coming and coming after that. Yeah, well, it was when I wrote... It was when I wrote Live Forever, actually. It was when... Um, when I wrote Live... When I wrote Live... Uh, we, were, we were pretty good up until the point where I wrote Live Forever. And then when I wrote that song, I knew enough about music to know... Oh, we've gone from... Uh, it's gone from being indie to classic now. And it was all, it was after that where that's where the benchmark was set. Nothing would would ever be good enough unless it was as good as that. Yeah, sorry, it was live forever. I'm, yeah. I'm mixing up my history there because yeah. they didn't believe you'd written it, right? Still don't. <laughs> 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 but but I remember playing it. To I remember playing it, and if you can imagine, it wasn't playing it on. on I didn't have an acoustic guitar at that point, so everything was written on the electric. Oh wow! So uh, I was you know in the rehearsal room, maybe. And we got to the end, and he was like, "You you've not just written that," and I was like. I wrote it last night, and he's like, "You've not just written that," <laughs> and um, yeah, he yeah he he was he was adamant that he would find it somewhere, you know. But it was like um, that was a, that I mean, it was one of those songs that just fell out of the sky. It just took half an hour twenty, just it was there. Wow, it's all there. And what's wow. great about that song is it's got no chorus. It's just it starts off with maybe you know, and the and the and what would be a bridge? Yeah, so the chorus is basically one thing. <laughs> which Liam to this you know was like, am I? Well, who's going to sing that bit? And I'm like, well, you're going to you're you're going to sing it. You're singing. He's like, yeah, we're not. <laughs> and he he gave up after. I mean, he gave up pretty soon. He's like, you're going to have to sing that bit. And I was like, okay, because that's not going to sound bad, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a defining bit of the yeah. whole song, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 uh, it used to be funny when he stopped singing that bit and before I started singing it, there's a bit where you do 20,000 people all do it. And he asks, he thinks I'll never see. And all the people go, yeah, we're not going. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first know? Yeah, this, it, right? I remember, like, that was the first Oasis reaction we posted yeah. to this channel way back in the day and i know for a fact liam sang it the high part on the record but i know in a live setting he doesn't do it because uh apparently in the uh, dvd commentary he said quote unquote if thought it was a bit gay which yeah. oh, come on man come on <laughs> freaking liam's gonna liam dude but especially liam? especially old liam or sorry then young liam young liam yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah. odd because I, you know, we've heard his latest uh, solo stuff. He does definitely does falsetto on that, so yep. I guess he, uh, I guess he got over it. Yep. Whatever. Yep. I mean, it's just interesting because I mean, these, these were kids that made it big, and they're like, all right, well, they we're stuck in our sound. One's him, one's him, and then they just got propelled up to the stratosphere. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's one that just falls out the sky right there. Yeah, that's crazy though. Like thirty minutes and yeah. The best songs that I think I've written don't take that long to get down on paper. I know the first day that didn't take long. It was like 20, 30 minutes. Wow. Something like that. Wow. So, so like one inspiration hits you. That's it. Yeah, Run exactly. It. Now it's interesting that he has the, um, what, what, what would you call it? A superstition or a, a belief that music's in the guitar. Like, I like that. I, I don't know why I like that, 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 that imagery that he paints. Of, it's a bit of, of a superstition, I yeah. think, or I i don't know, but I've, I've had the same guitars uh, for a little bit and, you know, the, there's stuff still coming out of them. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, it just depends on how, how, how they them. see it. You got to yeah. keep them for a while then. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm not, ex I've, I've, I've done well uh, through this, but still not quite at the point where I can just be like, Okay, there's no more music in that. Let's pick another one. So, quick question, because this is how my brain works. This man's Les Paul, that is, that is in his hands. Right? Yeah, it used to be Johnny Mars, used to be oh, Pete Townsend. If you Go if ahead. you forget the 
iconic hands that have held that guitar, right? What does that go for? Like uh, uh, a Les Paul. Like, uh, like these days? That? Yeah, how much is one of those? I have I no wanna, idea. I want to say like $5,000 like minimum. Holy shit. I'm going I'm to Google the price right now. At Guitar Center, uh, a classic electric Gibson Les Paul is – uh, twenty two hundred dollars on Z Sounds. It's twenty two hundred. Uh, so that's that's and, and like three thousand on Sweetwater. Some are like wow seventy two hundred on Sweetwater. Uh, but let me tell you about a little sponsor we have, Lloyd Guitars. Are you a guitar player and you want a nice, high quality guitar that the greats like BB King, Eric Clapton, Noel Gallagher, John Lennon have all played, but just seems a little bit out of reach price-wise? Look no further than Lloyd Guitars. They make guitars with the same material all other big guitar manufacturers make, but at an affordable price. Oh yeah. I mean, just yeah. look at this thing. He's got the bricks B on there. This neck just plays really smoothly. It just sounds nice, man. It sounds warm. I like it. 14 layers of paint applied over three days with bridges and pickups that stand out. Hand sanded fretboard. Oh yeah. Look at that. It's ready to rock and roll, yeah. man. You're ready. I know that when we talk, He's always playing this thing, fiddling around with it. It's awesome. Yeah, you can't separate this guitar from him. Oh it's, man, it's nice. just a warm sound right there. Heck yeah. I got my new instrument cut out for me. Yep. These should easily be four or five thousand yeah. dollar guitars and basses, yeah. but you go online and they're not any more than about six hundred pounds. How can you beat that you for this quality. level of quality here? Yep. And you get a lot more than what you pay for. This is gonna put rock and roll and just guitar based music back into the hands of where it belongs, the common everyday folk. Hi well everybody else, thanks for making a great product. Thanks. Thanks also for giving our audience fifty pounds off of their purchase use the promo codes right there on the screen it's also linked down in the description yep. to get 50 pounds off of your purchase thanks again lloyd guitars for sponsoring this portion of today's episode yeah. back to the video see go get your there you one. go there you go mm -hmm. simple good segue <laughs> thank you <laughs> did i answer yeah. your question yeah there i mean it's just it's just it's just good to know because you know uh that guitar that's blaring at me in the background looks like the one you got because yeah. it is but at a much more affordable <laughs> price yeah no but uh, anyway it's just interesting to see this man and his toys yeah yeah it, that's, this, that's what it is this just fascinates me man yeah. you know and i'm glad it's fascinating you too yeah no for sure i mean granted you you are the technical one you will know exactly what he's talking about. i'm like he's showing off his toys rightfully so mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's why we work so well together yeah you could ride a chain I started, do you know, when I, when I obviously had the guitar tuned and I got my own first guitar, which was a K, K? Hummingbird, yeah. right? It was black. I'm, I got it from my mum's catalogue. My mum ran the K catalogue, right? And um, I, I instantly started to, not, not to be a songwriter, but to, to do my own thing because mm -hmm. I often wonder sometimes, I see guitarists, right, who are extremely, extremely gifted and can play anything, but they can't write. Yeah. And it's, uh, I often wonder if, if I'd have been like, a, you know, a prodigious talent on the fretboard, I'd have concentrated on that, you know, and not on the strumming and, and, my, and my timing and, and, and the melodies and the chords. But I started to put together kind of things pretty pretty soon right. you know i've never been i mean now nowadays i can do i can do covers and you do them when you do in sessions they always want to cover now and do a radio session you know they say new and old one cover i'm like why have we got to do a cover you know there's only so many, so many bob dylan songs you can do you know mm -hmm. and um but yeah i often i often wonder if i was a if I was a, a wizard on the fretboard, would I would I've written songs so simple as Live Forever? You know, only mm. only a writer could have written it. Um, and I also think one of the great things about Oasis was we never had that guitar hero fella. 
you know, I, I would play solos, you know, but they weren't like, they, they weren't like these, I mean, they were, they fit the song and they were, and they were melodic and magical and they, and, it, and, and they were right. But I think the beauty of it was, is that anyone could play them. Well, you say that, <laughs> but I've heard a thousand bands play Don't Look Back in Anger, and I've never heard anyone play the guitar solo correctly. Well, come and see me live this summer, and you'll see <laughs> someone who still can't play it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but yeah, have you seen, there is a viral clip of, of Noel, like in his last tour, just completely butchering his own Don't Look Back in Anger solo. No, like, is there? Damn. It is, yeah, like, <laughs> but... But yeah, like that's the guitarists I I like. Like they're obviously the greats: Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page. Um, I would say, who else would I put on there? Uh, I don't even know. Uh, like Tony Imani from Black Sabbath, uh, Kurt Cobain. Like they they're they're technically great, but they're not flashy. They fit the song, which I've grown to like with Noel Gallagher. Is mm -hmm. that like it, it's not flashy. Like he more focuses on trying to serve the song and make a great, a great song. Got it. As opposed to yeah. you know, w uh, you know, guitar heroing it. Yeah, yeah. Even I though he, he is a guitar hero. Yeah, I, I I get that. He's not overstaying his welcome with the guitar. You know what I mean? He yeah. does just enough. Not yeah. Not with the bells and whistles. So. A hundred percent. Hundred percent. As you say, I mean the solo in that tune. Is so perfect for that song, yeah. and and a guitar player, uh, someone who's just a guitar player, mm. wouldn't approach no. it that way. If I'd have, if I'd have had, see now when I make records, I do delegate the guitar solo bits quite a lot, because I've I I, I, pref I prefer listening to all the guitars because I'm I'm a fan of you know when if Johnny's here or Paul Stacey's here or Weller you know playing guitar I'm kind of sitting there. Like, wow, not to Paul Stacey, of course, but to the other two. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, Stacey is an astonishing guitarist. He's an astonishing guitar player. He really, really is. Or if you're watching uh, any of the kids thinking, who does all the guitar solos on my records, the good ones are all Paul Stacey. He is amazing. He is. Um, but when you got like Weller and John, I just love, I just love listening to them play. Yeah. And um, I do play a few on this new record, but. If I'd have got in a session guy, let's just say I was writing Live Forever Tomorrow or Don't Look Back in Anger, and you would get one of your mates to play it, it wouldn't be the same. Right. There's, there's something, right. there's something, well, we all know there is something in the simplicity. And once you once you know too much, you can't just simplify it. Sure. Do you know what I mean? You have, you have to, you have to be a simple kind of, It's ah, the melody, the it's the- Defining myself as a simple to <laughs> <laughs> It's your melodies are so strong, whether you're playing on guitar or, or, or you know, within the, the song itself. And so what, you know, when you do a solo, it's like, it's the perfect addition. It doesn't take anything away. It doesn't take the focus away from, them, from what's going on with the rest of the song. It adds to the song. Yeah. Well, I, I put everything into the melody yeah. and the tune. If I've got if I've got what I consider to be a finished song, and the melody is great and the tune is great, you're there. Yeah. You can only you can't mess it up after that. And you know I've made records, which were written in the studio, like the one the one before this one that I made, which you were mm -hmm. present at a few times. Was well, they who, were who built the moon? Yeah, who uh, that was not written on a, on a guitar. It was written on synthesizers with drum machines and all that. And it was a challenge for me and I loved it. But I was making that record two years before I knew what I was doing. It didn't have a single song finished. It was all just vibes, do you know what I mean? Uh, but with when you're writing on a guitar, it's instant. And once it's there, it's there and you can't mess with it. But um, I put everything into the melody, everything, because that's what, that's what, people, are, that's what people remember. Because uh, how many songs do we know where? We don't know the words. Yeah, yeah. I don't know any. I remember doing a cover of Town Called Malice, right? On the last time I was doing it with Weller. And he kind of Googled it because we were rehearsing it before we got to this gig at Brixton. And I was singing it, singing it in with the band. I was looking at the words going, is this what it says? Because <laughs> no matter what we all say, when we're doing Town Called Malice, uh, 
you always just get to the bit, it's a big decision, it's how come hell is, you know, but the words, are, that song is amazing. And it's only until you start, oh, is that what it says? I'm, I'm not big on lyrics. As long as the lyrics fit the mood of the song, then that'll do for me, you know, and I, th I think it's a gift is to, I know when to let a song go and it's the, and not and not to make it too clever. It's just like just let it go now. Sure. You know, get on something else. Um, but it's fascinating when you see great guitarists. You know, like Johnny and Stacey and Weller. He's just like wow. They, I look at Johnny sometimes in here, and honestly, he looks like he's. It doesn't look like he's playing the most intricate arpeggiated thing in the world. I'd be grimacing on the floor. And he's, he'll talk to you while he's doing it. The track will be going, I swear to God, I've seen him do this. The track will be playing. And the way, the way he, he, he does it is, when he's... Come on, then. And we come. The one of dying. Oh, nice. <coughs> there we go. Uh, Dan, Dan knows how to fix these things. Uh, he doesn't let you send him the track. No right? way. Won't hear it, right? He's not interested in it. So he, he'll come in here, and I'll say, I've got three or four though. He's like, yeah, cool, whatever. And he plugs, he's got, he'll come down with a couple of guitars and his, his guy will turn up and he'll put a pedal board down and be in there. And he'll just listen to it and he'll start playing. And then he'll start telling you what he's about to do while he's doing it. He'll be like, so what I'm going to do it while he's doing it, so what I'm going to do it, I'm going to get to that bit there, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to bring it down there so it's dark. And I'll be like, how can you fucking do that and hold a conversation with someone? It's mad what he does. It's truly mad what he does. And have you ever met him? No. Yeah. You, Mick has, yeah, but I haven't yeah, met him. I mean, he, he's one of those guys that when he leaves the room, you're like, isn't fucking music brilliant? An art guitar's great. An art guitarist, the best people in the world. He like, makes you feel so enthusiastic and good about what, you know, about what you're doing. And you'd be great to get him on the show. I mean, oh, he, we'd love to have him on the show. It'd he's, be amazing. He, he is coming to our neck of the woods, so we'll have to hit is him he? up. Yeah. yeah, he's, he, we were in here, he set, he set out when we were doing this last album, and it's all written on the guitar, it's quite guitar heavy. And uh, he sees it, because like the guitar thing now is like, you see young bands, and they kind of wear them. Right. The guitarist kind of wears That's it. That's really interesting. And does a, there's noodles around it because bands feel like they have to have a guitarist, so they wear it. Johnny sees it as a duty, and he said this to me, it's a duty to play these fucking things, and we have to fucking, we have to bring them back. And uh, he's got an amazing take on it all, and uh, you should get him on the show, he'd be yeah. brilliant on this show. Amazing. It's a connection as well though, Noel, I think one, one thing that you... Yeah, like... Like I said earlier, I do love Johnny Marr. When I don't turn songs off from the Smiths, and I, I just don't, I ignore the lyrics, you know. That's but good melodies from Morrissey. Uh, just how he acts at uh, concerts, just not really for me. And uh, man, like that was that was that, that's good praise of Johnny of Johnny Marr right there. And I, I remember some good great guitar parts on. Uh, Council Skies. So I, I'm assuming that that was either Johnny or what's that guy, Paul Stacy? Yeah, or whatever that's that what guy is. Yeah, yeah. That's what he said. So I, it's I like I like that take. You know, it's your duty to 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 play that instrument, to yeah. to back it, to fight for it, bring it back, not just wear it, not just wear it. Yep. Yeah. You and he have in common is because he wrote it, because you imagine the melody, because you know how to bring it forward. I think that's what connects with people listening and why those songs become so iconic mm. and I guess publicly Dan and I wanted to say thank you yeah. because in that period there um, especially when it kicked off in the mid 90s uh, genuinely I think you were, you encouraged as many people to pick up guitar as, as anyone else who's anyone ever lived ever. yeah well thank you but I mean I have I have been in many a black cab and the guy and the guy doing the black car was saying you know what mate start to play guitar because of you and yeah. I was going and yet you're still driving a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I, no, I, I get that. A, a lot of a lot of bedroom kind of stuff. But that's how I started. Yeah. It's just strumming in the bedroom, and then, you know, but unbeknown to anyone, Bonard and Griggs have, have, have started the thing, and Liam got involved, and then he asked me to get involved. But the fact that you can sit and play a guitar for a couple of hours and it just passes is is that's an amazing thing to have turned other people onto, and. Yeah, I mean, the, 
the the guitar boom after we came along was huge. Oh, was huge. I think every guitar company should give you shares. Every amp company should give you shares. Because every the, gig should should be paying you royalties. <laughs> I I haven't done a cover gig in. 25 years without playing one of your songs. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. He's like, you like, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, it's kind of like there are those, the, particularly the, the ones from the 90s, honestly, they are, they're an incredible document of a moment in time yeah. for us all. The 90s was an amazing time for musicians. Yeah. Now we're living in the golden age of technology and pedals and all that kind of thing like the last 10 years possibly the last 10 or 15 years have been far fucking out with some of the stuff that comes out now <laughs> yeah. but in the 90s there was like you know we didn't have the internet so gigs were like it was an important yeah. thing you know and to be a musician in those times was an incredible thing, but th those songs that I wrote are an, are an amazing document of those times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we were watching, when we did the Nebworth documentary, we were watching all the footage back. It's amazing to see, so Oasis had this, ended up with this reputation as this laddish, really fucking kind of band. But actually early on, it was very, very mixed. There's lots of girls at the gigs and it, and our gigs were like a real proper celebration of something that we didn't know what we were celebrating, but it was just it something. It was something. Do you know what I mean? Um, but they were, they were, they were. The guitar ruled. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and guitars on the radio. It was on the radio all day. You know, yeah. you look at some of the some of the charts. Somebody showed me a, a, an album chart thing from Music Week, and in one week there was Oasis, The Verve, Pulp. Ocean Colour scene, all in the top 10, Manic Street Peters, all in the top 10. Nice. You know, it's crazy. Amazing. How did it go after that? And so definitely maybe blows up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a thing now, like the state of guitar music, like there's a lot of bedroom mus musicians, a lot of um, like Machine Gun Kelly brought guitar back a little bit with pop punk when it's pop punk days. And I would argue that today's guitar heroes are in country music like let's yeah. it's still you know going the the three of the top songs right now uh whether you like them or not are from jason aldean morgan wallen and luke combs and those are all guitar forward yep. uh songs even though one of them has click tracks one of them's a cover one of them's uh well we'll, we'll talk about that but yeah. th a lot of it is you know, that's a lot of you know guitarists uh are thriving in in that community um and also i would argue a modern guitar hero would be taylor swift because you know she wrote all of her own songs and still plays guitar live and you know inspired a lot of girls to pick up acoustic guitars so i'm not saying in that regard uh, okay. of what noel gallagher is talking about right now I, I, yeah okay i got you i can i can i can bridge that gap with you until you said Taylor Swift, but <laughs> I understand if you're talking about original Taylor Swift, like tear drops on my guitar, Taylor Swift, I'll yeah. give you that. Not right, right. I'm not not going to do that. I'm not right. Gonna, <laughs> I'm well, not folklore go. had guitars on it. Come on, who? The 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 Taylor Swift's one of her last uh, folk album that she's put out recently. I'm sorry for her album then. <laughs> I hope she did well. I hope she did well. Um, I just, for me, man, it's just like the the bands he named on the radio. It, yeah. I mean, he 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 described complete talent on the radio, like instrumental talent, like yeah, musical Oasis, talent. Yeah, even Pulp, though they were on the radio, Ocean Color Scene, Blur, Manic Street Preacher, yeah, like all great guitar, like real music. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like, then being on the radio, you're surrounded with other talented people, not people necessarily that paid their way into, bought their way into that scene. Right. They right. they fought their way to be heard on the radio. So your your class in your that was around you on the radio was quality. Yeah, yeah. In the mid '90s, for that, that was yeah, a man. Peak. 
I'll yeah. Peek. Those, those are some pretty awesome names to be surrounded in. Absolutely. You know? It's just, it's wild, man. It's wild. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know where I went. Uh, you threw me with the Taylor Swift. So I'm like, I'm in. Oh, okay, I'll that's give what I was going to. I was going to say this. I was going to say this. I think it's because even though country, and I know a lot of our people are like, could give a fuck about country. I understand that over there. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that completely. Um, but it is one of the last genres of music that has been completely taken over by like the digital sound by your, and even though you have click tracks and stuff like that, you have, it's still guys playing guitar as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. So there's a solo. There's solo really well. Still. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and it, it kind of self polices itself because now Luke, the Luke Bryans and the Florida Georgia Lions are no, aren't as prevalent. And every time one of them pops up, a crop of Tyler Childers, Sturgill Simpson, yep. Zach Bryan crop up to kick them to the curb. Yep. 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 Pretty much. Yeah. So uh, if you don't like the Taylor Swift analogy, I'll say Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran sure. is a great guitar hero, great guitar ambassador for modern times. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you start doing big shows. You start to take this kind of rig out, and all of a sudden, as the venues get bigger, what are some of the challenges that you faced playing wise? Well, that I got, I, I swapped, I remember I swapped the, the WEM for an iron orange stack for a while. I couldn't tell it was, I couldn't tell you which one it was and I bought that simply because of Peter Green because right? I love I mean he's one of my favorite ever guitarists and uh, and the or you know it's a very 70s thing and and they look oh, you know, to have an orange yeah, yeah. cab on stage at the time was like wow man um, but I but the, the the challenge when we went into morning glory was we we went we never demoed any of it. And I wrote them all on an acoustic guitar mm -hmm. on the road or in hotel rooms. And the, the challenge was, it wasn't an intentional thing, but the song, the sound of the songs had changed. It had gone from rock and roll style, cigarettes and alcohol, bring it on down to, uh, you know, champagne supernova, like eight minutes long, and all the way that it moves and all that. And then, um, Wonderwall, which everybody in the band went, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I don't fucking think so. <laughs> right? I remember our kids saying, <laughs> no, forget this. Why are you writing reggae songs? <laughs> and I was like, there speaks a man who's never heard reggae. <laughs> you know, it's like, Reg what? Reggae? <laughs> and, uh, but the... <laughs> I'm just... Because, look, we came up, like, uh, we we're discovering local reggae uh, starting out, you know, when we first were mm -hmm. seeing each other in the DC yeah. scene. Uh -huh. Wonderwall's not reggae. No, not by any kind of drug-induced anything is it reggae. I could never, I would never do that to reggae, and I would never do that to this song, that song right. ever. Right, both would be a disservice to call Wonderwall <laughs> reggae. Yeah, oh, I love that. They're like, eh, "Would you write reggae songs?" <laughs> no, Marley, I can see it now. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Mm. So, because I'd got on such a mission as a songwriter, and it was right. ha and it was happening. Yeah, I could feel it happening. And we go back to the from that day of Live Forever. Every song that I wrote up until I'd say 97 is now world famous. And it was just a moment in time where I was living out of a suitcase. I had no you know, a girlfriend and anywhere to live. Uh, that was my thing. And I was writing, you know, I gave the master plan away as a B-side because someone said, well, we need an extra track. It was like, when you put singles out, they had to have four tracks on. We'd run out, we only had three, we'd run out of songs. And it's like, we'll write another one. And I was like, okay, it shall be done. You know, and then kind of played them the master fan. Nobody said, whoa, what are you doing? That's way, you know, that's took that, what? You can't have the B-side. Everyone was like, great, let's do it. 
you know, and it's only like years later where you go, fuck. <laughs> And talk tonight and half the world away, all those great yeah. B-sides. Oh, man, half but, the world away. Yeah. Do, do you, in that period, did you just know that's a great yeah. song? You just, you just like, knew it. Because they come, one of the, one of the rules, not that there are any hard and fast rules about songwriting at all, you can do anything, you can, you know, a song is a song is a song, it doesn't matter. But for me, if a song comes quick, right. okay. if it comes quick, it's usually going to be a good one. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule because Rock and Roll Star, which is one of my favourite ever songs, took a long time to write that song. It's just, I, I, I got the title and was just determined to see this song through. It took ages to write. And it's a great tune. But nine times out of ten, the quicker they come, the better they are, because they're coming from a place of just inspiration, not thinking about it too much. But yeah, I kind of know. I know. And there's been, I've been wrong a few times, but not many, not many. And I think, I remember saying to somebody uh, early, early on, like, um, you have to make it look easy because you have to entice other people into it. <laughs> you're upstage grimacing, sweating, and like, sitting Paul Stacey play live. <laughs> Honestly, it looks like he's having a, he's not having a fight with a bear, right? He's like, he's, oh, he's really kind of, oh, and he's like, Man, that would not make me want to play the guitar, right? <laughs> so I was like, you have to make this look easy. It gets other people into it. But to, go, to yeah, it's usually the quicker they come, the better they are. And the more simple a song, but the, you know, the chords of, what's that? It's nothing. That's nothing. I mean, you, I mean I, you know. But, but it couldn't, but, but, but you play that and it can't be know, anything yeah, else. Know, yeah. But it's the melody. It's what you put on the top of it yeah. is what it is. And that's, you know, I see great, great guitar players. Do you know, they're playing all these kind of chords and this, that and the other. And, like I said at the top of the thing, they can't write, yeah. you know, and you can't learn songwriting. You cannot learn it. You can learn that. You can you can learn the scales and all that kind of thing and the hateful notes that you two play sometimes. And I watch your thing. <laughs> There's a fucking knot. It's all guitarists do it, and it's just a thing. And I think that I love the blues. <laughs> right? I do love the blues, Guilty. but there's but there's a kind of note that. I, don't, I couldn't even play it to you now, but if you yeah. were to noodle away, I'd go, that, that's, that, that, that's that, it. that that's fucker it. there, <laughs> that one. It's like a wee, it's like a weeping, sounds like a crying middle-aged woman <laughs> who's peeling an onion, right? That note, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, I, I've, the many a time I've had my iPad gone, wait, oh, where is he? I know it's four in the morning in England. I will call him though, that's hateful. Um, but it's about it's it's all about it's all about it's all about what you put on top of it, mm. you know. And as a you can't you can't learn that. That's just something that's in you. Yeah. You know, you see this this AI thing now, mm. right? And somebody sent me the Oasis things, and it's like we well, can sound like Liam, yeah. right? And you can you can you can get you can get there. You can't write those songs. Yeah. You just cannot do it. Yeah. A machine can't do it. It can get as close as machines do, yeah. you know, like amp simulators and fucking this, that, and the other, and all that. But it's not it, no. you know, and that, that's art, you know, yeah, that comes from absolutely. artists, you know. And um, it's, a, it's a gift. Yeah. It is a gift. It, and it has been a gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having yeah. the confidence to let it flow as well, like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, man. I Freezer? love that he knows exactly. I, we know exactly what he's talking about. I'm like, I love that he's heard that. Like, fuck yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we, <laughs> Breezer, y'all okay? DM us on Instagram. Like, yeah. I, I, I know you made a little stink about it when this came out. So, uh, y'all okay, Breezer? I love yeah. your, I love the record with, yep. with, without the Liam uh, voice on it. It's brilliant. Like, so. I, uh, I I agree with what he's saying. It's like, you know, there are songs that are lyrically driven and musically driven. 
yeah. you know, and lyrically driven, they have to, you have a, uh, let's not, uh, and I hate saying simple. It, uh, simple is like a very, I want to say negative term when it comes to music, right? It's simple. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's dumb. No, there's, there's a power in simplicity. You know, simplicity right. generates earworms. Yeah, simplicity earworms. Simplicity is, is it, that's, I can sing it back to you, you know, right. kind of thing. And right. they mastered that during their time. It's like, yeah, okay, like you said, four chords, five chords max. <laughs> and then, yeah. But lyrics, it's a lyrically driven band. Yeah, and that, lyrics and melody, melody driven. Yes. More, like some of the, like, slowly walking down the hall faster than a cannonball. What the hell does that mean? No, no, exactly. But it's not a, it's not a, like you said, it's not like a shredding song. It's not like a, you're, 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 you're melting the guitar. Right, you know, right, and it, yeah, it you're, you're you're right, and he brings up a good point to like you know it's what you put on top of them of the chords. There's only like thirty six chords on a guitar. There, you're gonna run out of new chords really quickly, and I mean you can do like like sevenths and sustained second, sustained fourth, um, things like that, uh, minors and minor sevenths, major sevenths, uh, but at the same time. There's still not a only so much real estate you could work with. It's what you put on top of it that matters. Yep. Yeah. I guess. Well, I guess the more I find the more the more you do it, the easier it gets. If um, if you kind of take your foot off the ga and gas and not write for a bit, it kind of it kind of goes away. Mm. But there are. Weller told me once very early on when I just met him, because <clears throat> he went through a period where he didn't have a record deal, he didn't have a publishing deal, didn't have anything. And he just said, look, if it dries up, just don't chase it. Once you chase it, it's gonna get further away. You have to let it come to you, you know. And what I tend to do is write is stockpile songs. Okay. Yeah. And then, but I still do chip away every day. I play the guitar every, every day. Not, yeah, every, every day, whether it be for 10 minutes before I'm leaving or half an hour at night, Every day, it's just not to sit and write anything, but I've I've always got songs that are in various states of completion, and then one day I'll just say, "Oh, what about that one? I'll try that one today." And um, yeah, it's just it's something that uh, yeah, it's something that you shouldn't chase. You know, if you let it find you, I think I think it's I think for me it works anyway. Yeah. So who who were the yeah, another uh, fair point there. I do have like 10, 12 different uh, lyric ideas in the notes section of my phone. And the ones that I've just written recently and put out, um, those are, you know, times where I'm, you know, just uh, just let them come to me. Like I'll be sitting here editing for, for this channel or, you know, just be sitting out, you know, doing nothing. And it'll, mm -hmm. the car, the guitar will just, call my name and be like, come play me, come play me. And there you go. Yeah. There you go. The guitar players, when you picked up the guitar and, you, and there was obviously a connection there, who had you heard? Because one thing that's really interesting about going back and listening to the early, the early stuff and, and the progression of that, Everyone knows the songs like intimately and everyone can sing along the songs. The flipping guitar sounds are just so huge. And then, mm -hmm. and, and when you go and look at the, um, the live footage, this wall of mm -hmm. sound and like at that point, marrying that really, cause it's, it's a rock guitar sound. Mm -hmm. it's, it's massive and marrying that with these incredible songs was something that, you know, if, I think a lot of people, as fans, if you just if you just listen to the guitar sounds, it's like wow, mm. it's you know. But it's all because it's all it's all coming from the amplifiers themselves. Right. I know this is a pedal show and all that, but there was there was there was very very little, if any, pedals. Yeah. We weren't into them. They weren't back in the nineties. They weren't they weren't a thing. They're a thing now. I love mm. pedals, and I've got thousands of the fucking things. <laughs> and every what nice. every. Every pedal has got one, does one great yeah, thing, yeah. or some that this Strymon stuff does. You know, you know, you get lost in that. But the only thing, the only thing that me and Bonehead worked out 
It's like I was I was saying you just play bar chords, right? And I only play open chords. I will. That's why he's a capo so much, right? Is I will go to the ends of the earth not to do this, right? Right? Because when you do that in a gig, you make a funny movement, right? <laughs> I don't look good, right? You kind of, uh, whereas if you're playing the open chords, you don't even look at them, you know. Um, but the only thing was like, you know, Donna would just play bar chords. And I was like, you okay doing that? Because it, I, you know, I'd have to in the hospital. And he was, he was great at, you know, not even playing majors. He was just like, for rock and roll style, he would just play, play that. Wouldn't even play the, the majors, you know what I mean? Yeah. And. But that was the only thing that we sat and worked out was like, yeah, if you just play bar chords and I play open chords. And of course, everything is just coming from the amps. Yeah. The amps right. are driven. That's where the, because you can do it with pedals and tube screamers and blah, 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 and all that. They didn't have them in the 60s. Yeah. They had a fuzz pedal, right? And that, and that was it, that overdrive. It's better if it's all coming from the amp. That, that, that was what, that was our thing. and. It, it, and with with that, and us both playing semi acoustics as well, which is a no no, right? Oh. We found out. Everyone, you know, you go to America and say, "Hey, why? What are you guys playing solid body guitars?" And we'd just be like, "What?" I remember some guy saying to Bonehead, uh, American, saying, "You just played the same shape chords all night." And went, yeah, I know, and you just paid forty dollars to go and see it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's all coming from the amplifiers. Mm. Really getting them as 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 to the point where they just are begging for mercy, right. you know. And then take it back a tiny little bit, and then let the the engineer do the rest. Um, but yeah, you can't you can't you can't get that. You know, you see all these pedals now, the amp in a box, and they yeah. are great. Thorpey stuff is fucking. Fun. I mean, these guys. Are geniuses. They are, geniuses. They are I've been in it. I, I love, you know, if, if you order a pedal and, you know, I love it. Um, the amps in the box are great, but there's nothing quite like an amp begging for mercy. And, Absolutely. you know, they, that, that, that is, and it's a, it's a dying thing now because the studios are shutting down now. You know, there's not many places where you could go and get a band to play loud in a studio. Um, or live for that matter. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that towards the end, but let's do it now. You know, like before it gets to that. Yeah, um, to the point about you know, every studio I've been into, like aside after recording songs about nothing, like it's you know just a, a plugins of amplifiers, not actual amplifiers. I guess to cut down on costs because. Amps are fucking expensive. Yeah, they are. Like, not gonna lie, uh, but it, it's a shame that that's a dying art form. But but most music consumers don't really know the difference. And I've kind of learned that, like, not nerding out so much about it. Don't be focused on that. Don't look at listen to the opinions of other musicians that are not doing anything as great as what you're doing. Yeah. Just make a great song. Make it sound great. And people will come. Yep. 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 Too busy. W would you call that being almost like an elitist? Yeah. Like, just kind of like, just kind of like, hey, man, does it sound fucking good? Yeah. You know, let's just leave it at that. But I mean, it's 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 crazy. Like, I I do I would say I agree with him. There's nothing like the sound of stacks upon stacks begging for mercy. That's yeah. kind of like the dream is to go to eleven. You know, yeah. turn it up to eleven. Yep, that's pretty much it. And um, it's a shame that it's less and less of that happening. You know? Yeah, yeah. And and the other point of this segment I wanted to say is I, you know, Noel and Bonehead's uh, method of Noel doing open chords, uh, Bonehead doing bar chords, like that's uh, that's actually what I do in my own live setting. Is that I will. Like when I do like the first day, like I'll I'll build a loop with the bar chords, and then mm -hmm. in the chorus do simple uh, chords, hmm. like uh, like the a, a D shape there, and then uh, a D shape like like that to kind of uh, make a, a more complex sound and just you know cool. lift the chorus up a bit. 
Cool, man. So, so like, that's, and, and it works. It like it complements itself because it yeah. it has to because <laughs> it's yeah. It's math. Yeah, different it's music. Different shapes. Different yeah. shapes. Different sounds. And and that's it. Brings up a great point. It's all in the amplifiers. If it sounds great there, you're there. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So that whole sound and that whole vibe was all about a lot of noise coming off the stage and mm -hmm. you know I, I, I dare say a lot of the guitar parts you came up with was because the guitar was yeah. reacting in a certain yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you how do you deal with that now and how do you feel about that now for bands? Well, now you're either playing in a bar or you're playing in a stadium. There is or an arena. There's nowhere in between. Oh, Everything that's been most of them are now shut down or they run down or turned into flats. So you're either playing, you know, quietly, you know, noodling about, or you, or you play, and guitar music, I mean, new guitar bands don't really get to play arenas these days. But I don't know what I think about it. I think, obviously when we were coming through, just in London alone, there was like half a dozen amazing historical venues where all the all the greats played. And one by one, they all kind of go to the Astoria and the Hammersmith Palais and they all go to the wall and the 100 Club and all that. Um, and I, I guess it's just, you know, commerce now in the world dictates everything. Yeah. Absolutely everything in the music business all the way to, the, to everything. So. Yeah, and, and, and I guess, I guess, I guess, music is tailored. Music reflects society in some way, doesn't it? You know, I think I think of I think of guitar music now as yeah, it's good looking. <laughs> Looks good, you know. It's like a shiny new thing, you know. But really, really, you know, wouldn't you have a battered old Rover, you know, <laughs> than a brand new electric Japanese car? <laughs> I mean, but well, maybe that's just us. I would hazard a guess it's just us. It could be. Uh, maybe we could reflect a little bit on no so it's all Les Pauls in the uh, early days and then there seemed to be a quite a swift move to seven yeah. hollows and well for, uh, in the real early days it was an epiphone Les Paul yeah. and then because we're such Beatles fanatics we uh, we were into epiphones and me and Bonehead we went down oh, to oh, let me just put this over here me and Bonehead went to Johnny Roadhouse in Manchester. Ah! Oh, no, no. It'll be. We went to Johnny Roadhouse in Manchester and we both bought Epiphones. He's got a brown tobacco one, which, funnily enough, when the band split up, he didn't take with him. So well, I've got it now. <laughs> oh. And I bought this odd looking wine red one and strictly because of the Beatles I had no And I'm that's not, that guitar. That's is this is this I wrote <laughs> all of what's the story morning glory on this. Da, These are out. all this is all the rhythm guitar parts. And I didn't I only realised Recently, because Epiphone have cloned it. Yeah. Recently, which is a really, it's a really good version of it actually. But we did a bit of digging around on it, and it's it's an '80s Japanese one that some guy did, and it's an odd colour, but I, I, it's got such a twang to it. And um, yeah, this was. I just like the. I just like. I'm always forever changing with guitars. I get. I, I do. I do fall in love with a particular thing and I will stick with it for ages, but I, I know it's going at a certain right. point. You know, like now I'm into jazz masters. I mean, where I don't know where that came from. Hmm. Um, but this, this is, I mean, if I think of some of the things I wrote on this guitar, I mean, I wrote Dr. Black and Angle on that guitar. Nice. In Paris, in a, in a hotel room one night. And I wrote, I wrote Champagne Supernova on that guitar. Wow. I wrote, wow, wow. I wrote them all. I know. And when I think of it, and it's just, you know, it's not, it's not particularly sought after. It's not vintage. It's mm -hmm. not this, that, and the other. It's just. They just had a vibe. It, it just, fe it just yeah. feels right. 
it feels right when you're sitting there and it feels right and it fits fits your hands and epiphones for years that's all i played because they fit i've only got little hands as i said that they fit my hands until i found this which has got the smallest neck in history when you pick that up it's insane that guitar but this riviera is yeah, I mean, that's a, this is a special, special, special guitar. And the stock pickups, there's nothing been changed? Nope, nothing. Wow. I don't, I, I don't, um, like, I've only ever modded one guitar, which is that black Les Paul there, which is another one that got Johnny, <laughs> which he's fucking, he's insane. That's what he, that's on the Queen is dead. Do you mind if I pick it up? Yeah, 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 I've got to have a look at it, yeah. That's, that's his guitar. All right, before he gets to that, I just want to say, yeah, uh, that type of guitar that Noel has right there has been my dream guitar, like, forever and ever and ever. Really? And because I was a big, I, I became a Beatle maniac uh, in my uh, introverted uh, high school self. I discovered the Beatles and both John Lennon, George Harrison, and even Paul McCartney when he did guitar sometimes, all played those semi-hollow uh, Epiphone uh, casinos is what it was called. Uh, I mean, the the shape now is a Gibson ES three five five, and also I was looking in like BB King and early Eric Clapton, and they all played the uh, uh, those semi hollow guitars, Ooh. and and I, I guess it what helped me gravitate towards Noel a lot more because he that's was his guitar during the Oasis days, and what made me fall in love with the Lloyd guitar that we talked about earlier in the video, and then because that is a ES355 and I just I love it. It's just my it's it my dream. It feels right. It feels yeah. like this is this is my space now. Yes, yes. And and he's right like yeah, has a certain just feel like you know bluesy kind of delty kind of twangy little country. So there's there's a bit of that in there along with you know the bluesiness and the uh beautiful weirdness of both the Beatles and and uh early o oh, oh wait I wouldn't say beautiful weirdness but you, you get what I'm saying yeah no I got you yeah so it's like your it's like your what is it like your SUV of guitars you can do yeah a lot of things and it sounds like a lot of things like yeah it's not just um yeah I I I, I get what you're saying I just can't formulate it into words I know. right now yeah 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 but but hi well thank you Love you, bud. <laughs> <laughs> from the Queen is dead, and I, we'd got in a, we'd got in some fight on stage, and that guitar had got damaged, so he sent this one down. <laughs> nice. So many years later, he said, oh, "Oh yeah, that's the one on the Queen is dead. The, you know the wah wah that goes all the way through it. That's the one he played on it." But so years later, he was down at my studio, and he said, "We still got that black Les Paul," and I was like. And I instantly, I instantly started to get the sweats because somewhere down the line, the pickups had got damaged, right? And I'd taken them out, right? And those P90s are from uh, Firebird that I had, uh, right? So, and it was only then that he said, well, that's the Queen is Dead guitar. And I was like, the fucking told me that earlier <laughs> before, I, before I butchered it. Before I butchered it. What does the switch do? Well, I that's a coil tap, okay. right? Which he had put in. I, I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know anything about coil taps and all that. But that's on. You know the um, de, 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 on what story morning glory? Yeah, that's, that's, that's 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 guitar. That's that guitar. Yeah. I want to ask you about that because that's such a great yeah. sound. Well, right. yeah, and uh, you know now when Gem when Gem <laughs> does it or Gem did it in Oasis. He'd have a he'd have a raft of pedals on to get the sound, and that was, I bought a couple of Vox Conquerors, the big Beatles stacks, yes. and that's just into them. You know, there might have been a Marshall mixed in there somewhere, but yeah, well that's that's that guitar, and that guitar actually is the heaviest piece of equipment I've ever picked up in my life, and you know what? It's a solid ten, I would say. Oh wow! And you know that. I've said to him a few times, do you want these back? You know, it's kind of like a bit, and he's like, no, 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 they're yours now, man. I was like, really? You know, I was like, really? And um, yeah, but there's there's a Stratocaster there, which when I tell you what that has been on, which will blow your mind. Okay. Can we, 
can we have a listen to these two yeah. before we before we move on? So um, what, about, get, what about what about Amsterdam? Should we stay? Should we stay I'd with say, these? Um, I'd or? say no. I'd say well no because that's gone by that point. I get mixed. Yeah. Put the vox on. Can I turn these off then? Can you yeah. So sadly, the Vox Conquerors have been sold because they were just too big and mad. And um, but I will say, you know that pedal that came out, that guy that did the Dr. Robert pedal. Yeah. Oh yeah, the Acclaim. Acclaim. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking unbelievable. It's great. That's that's on my new record, and it's the closest I've ever heard to that kind of thing. I've got a track on my new album called There She Blows, which is just and it sounds like the Beatles anyway, but it's <laughs> it's uh, with that. With that thing, it's amazing. That is that sound. And that was the live, that was my live rig for years and years and years. And, and that's just the end. That's just, there's nothing on that. There's not even, well, when, so there's a pedal here, I'm sure you can see. Yeah, we'll get a detail of that right, later. The echo drive, that has been part of my sound for years. So that is the sound, but when you play it live, so. It's so rock and roll. <clears throat> I know. So I never have the echo drive, but I still use this to this day. I never have the, the delay turned the on. The delay on it at yeah. all. It's got the it's got it's got a valve in. It's got the best fucking drive on it <laughs> ever heard. And I for years I couldn't do anything without it. I couldn't do anything without it. I couldn't do a fucking sound check or a gig or anything without it. It just had that thing when you played it in a big venue. It was amazing. Um well, obviously I didn't have that when we were recording Morning Glory, but that is effectively that sound. And this one here, so this is a Vox AC30 that I bought off a, off a guy. So at the bottom, it's got the little, the little sign says bass. Oh. So it's a Vox, so it's a bass, it's a Vox bass. And I bought it off a guy who worked for the Hollies, who was selling it. And they'd got it from the cavern. It was a cavern house amp, oh, right? The cavern club. And when I went to do, when we went to do Morning Glory, I needed, because the songs had got a bit more, or a bit less garagey and sure. punky, they got a bit more thought out. I reached that point in, we've all been there, where you say to yourself, I think I'm ready for a Stratocaster. Mm. Right, and then it's it's a weird moment, right? If you played these all your life and you get a little strat, and it's like, wow, what's that nonsense? And yeah. uh, I bought this box, and I've had it ever since. And this is the this is the Don't Back in Anger box. Um, I played it. I only ever used it for the Morning Glory sessions, ever. I one well, when I first started the solo thing. Uh, I had an American guitarist called Tim Smith. Hey, Tim. And uh, he was like, can you use that amp? And I was like, are you fucking joking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. You can get one that looks like it. You're not using it. <laughs> and um, Nice. But it's a great, it's a great amp. Can we switch that one on? Mass fucking sing along. Oh. 
Yeah, so that's wow. it. so that's 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 the amp. Um, but when it came to the solo, I played it on that Stratocaster, which is just let me go and, go and get it. Is another one that I got off Johnny, all right? But this one I bought off him because I was feeling a bit bad. It's like, <laughs> fucking hell, hey, give me another one. And um, so I'd never had a strat. I'd never played anything with single coil pickups. I didn't, I'm not sure I even knew or was interested in, in the difference to it. Now I played this guitar on the morning glory sessions and then this guitar is on Wonderwall, it's on Don't Look Back in Anger, it's on, uh, and then it went, I, I never seen it again, it went with the amp, went off, never seen it, for about 25 years, then one day, I don't know what on earth, it ended up, I don't know why, I was like, well there's that, it was in somewhere, and I took it home, and I wrote What A Life on it, right? Oh nice. So this is the guitar from What A Life. I was talking to Johnny about it, and I was saying that guitar, and he said, oh yeah, I wrote Girlfriend in a Coma on that. I wrote Stop Me If You Think You've Heard This One Before on that. And he listed all these songs. And this guitar, you know, it's a, it's a pre, it's got the three selector switches in it. It's a pre-CBS, I don't even know, even as a guitar, if it, had, if it had any famous songs in it, they're quite rare and worth a few bob. But this guitar is a Do I embarrass myself here when I'm trying to play this guitar solo? Come on. I can't even fucking play it myself. But it's an, I have, I have, and then, you know, I never play it. I never take it out of its case. It's just kind of, Johnny's been doing a, a, a photograph book for his guitar collection, which is going to be amazing. And we were here. And I was like, oh, that's Strat. And we started talking about it. And he's like, do you ever play it? And I was like, no, I never play it. I never get it out from the studio. It's just, but it's played on some amazing tunes. And um, yeah, but that, the, that and these two are the, they're the morning glory era sound. Um, it's mad to hear it, you know, absolutely crank through the AC30 and this thing sounded killer with a 412. Incredible. Well that, yeah, the, the Vox through the Marshall, there's something about it that I couldn't, I, I'm not articulate enough about what happens when you marry the two together, mm. other than you plug it in and you go, fuck off, <laughs> <laughs> just stand back, get out of the way, I'm about to play E minor. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole bunch of harmonics and stuff and the, like the cla you get the, the jangly of the strings, especially on the Strat there, but also on, uh, on the Epiphone. Epiphone. And yet there's loads of overdrive and it, that just doesn't happen at low volume. No, I don't yeah. think it happens. No, and you got, and I, I, at that point I'd mastered the art of playing a semi-hollowed guitar at loud volume. Yeah, yeah. that's and tough. I, it is, yeah. and I'd managed to, and I'd managed to work it, and throw the odd backing vocal in as well. So I was, I really, I do miss that sometimes because now I, I kind of sit, and strum, and I'm thinking about, you know, the word, the words, and all that. And I do think my guitar playing, that what it was, it wasn't technically mm. proficient and all this, but. When I see people do the Oasis thing, I was like, it sounds all right, but it doesn't sound like, yeah. it's not the real deal. No. And the real deal is a hollow body guitar, but being in the right position where it's just about to get out of control, but you can still keep it in line and play, and play the, and, and you know, and pick out the subtleties of the notes mm. and that. Um, and I got really, really good at that. Uh, and it took me quite a while to get rid of that. I took right up until 
into the 2000s I was still kind of learning what it was and um, but there's just that you're right there's something about that that you cannot do no matter how good your pedals are there's just something about it because pedals are not a lot an amplifier is alive yeah. you know it's alive yeah. and you know if you go too far it's going to pack up on you yeah pedals don't pack up no. you know unless you're using batteries you know but um did you have to do any work on the guitars to manage the feedback or was that just no embraced it really yeah, yeah. so a gazillion watts at Nebworth, yeah your... yeah just embraced it got into it as a matter of fact it became I think if you don't use pedals, the feedback is a lot more harmonic and, na and natural. Because <laughs> if you've got like a, you know, if you've got a compressor on or this or something like that, they can get, they can be a little bit, ugh, you know, but there's just something about hollow body guitars, semi hollow body, mm. a casino, forget it. You're yeah, chasing yeah, yeah. that all over the stage, you yeah. know, forget it. But there's something about the semi hollow guitars that, and when I got this, guitar here and I learned how to use that big speed properly mm. and to learn I started to play I started to strum it less and use that more yeah. and there's a real art to it that I that I really I really miss now just being a guitarist and kind wow. of just just working that and sound. just yeah, yeah 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 and I used to love it because when I I would um I never had my guitar in the monitors ever. Really? Not for Why? over twenty years. Wow. Even on those giant. Never had it. Wow. I you, when a couple of times when I'd left tours and blah blah blah, and, you know, uh, Gen would stand in for me, and uh, they, he, he called me up once and he said, "Just put your monitor set up on." And I was like, "Right," and he went, "There's nothing in it," and I was like, "No, no." And he said, Does it, well, there's only vocals in it. And I was like, well, yeah. And he said, how do you hear yourself? I was like, I'm in the gig. I'm on stage. I'm in the gig. Yeah. I'm not, there's not a separate <laughs> gig coming out of here. I would always stand facing the drummer. I don't need to hear the drums. I don't need to hear the keyboard player. I don't need to hear the, I can hear them from the PA. You know, and I would just get, and I would not, I've, I've never heard my guitar, even to this day. I never have my guitar in the mix, ever. I've had a little bit now with uh, um, the, the yes. in-ear monitors, uh, which would, which again, if Oasis came along now and you're using them, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. Wow. Because we had like crappy monitors and then we had the best monitor system and side fills, you know, and I remember now it's all in, you know, because of commerce, you can't afford to bring your own monitor rig anywhere, anywhere but it's all kind of in-ear. And that takes a lot of getting used to, and it kind of it does it does strangle the life out of you until you get used to it, and then obviously, then you can't use monitors anymore because sure. your brain freaks out. Mm. But yeah, I've never had my guitar in the never. I, don't, I was like, I, I heard it from you know over this side, and I would all I would also be staring at the drummer. Right. I just in time with the drummer. Forget everybody else. Um, but there is an art. There's an art to use in this and not in the way that you know like fucking spaghetti western shit you know it's just kind of like i i've got so addicted to that mm. it took me ages to wean myself off that guitar and get into just playing and and right and i had to really tone it all down because of singing and i have to stand in the middle of the stage now and it was took me ages to get into it whereas with oasis i was over there in my own world and i was working that and uh, I loved it. And I do miss it sometimes, i got to say. You know, so what's this one? Can we hear a bit of that in a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That answers that question for me. What's and, that uh, question? The one that I always harped on. It's like stoic knoll, you know? Always standoffish, never in the mix kind of thing. And yeah. that's because he was watching the drummer trying to listen to himself or trying to keep he had a lot of other things going rather than the gig, whereas whereas Liam was knee deep in the gig. You right, know? he's the front man. He's yeah. you know working the crowd like he doesn't really work the crowd like yeah. Freddie Mercury does, but like that's he's he's the front guy. Yeah. He is the the showman, and Noel is on the side of the stage. Like I'm starting to relate more to Noel in my. Uh, doing this like i'm 
not only am I, you know, watching the video and formulating what um what I'm saying, I'm gonna say when I pause it, finding a good time to pause it, uh, but I'm also just making sure the audio is good and, and you know I'm doing a lot over here. Yeah. And like I, I now relate to him a lot more because you know he's yeah. he's just in the gig, he is in the zone. He is more of the he is more of the the puppet master kind of thing. You know, yeah. he is he doesn't need to be the show, the show's happening. He's just in it. He's he's there, he's he's analyzing and picking up on cues that necessarily aren't aren't he's putting together visual and audio cues for himself for him to be playing. And that's kind of why maybe in those gigs I'm like, what you know, why is he so stoic? Why is he not embracing the inner rock star that he is? In some of his earlier stuff that we checked out, you know, yeah, and uh, and that now that answers a, it answers a big question I had, or a big misconception I had about him, in the very beginning, yeah. in the very beginning, you know, but, yeah, no, it's 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 just I just, I just had that aha moment, yeah, X, I'm glad, man, I'm glad, um, and that's like. I, I guess I'm not at that point yet where I need in-ear monitors because I'm doing solo acoustic gigs with a looper pedal, and I can hear it from my monitor and that, like, like the the PA that I bring. That's all I I really need uh, so far. I mean, hopefully we'll get to that point yeah. where I need the in-ear monitors. That would be so, awesome. It will yeah. happen, Spence. Yes, yes. Uh, link to my music uh, down in the description. Yes, everyone. Yeah, so this, if you plug that through the, the 50, please, Mick. So I've never had a really expensive guitar ever. And this is about 1996. It was at the end of the Morning Glory tour. Some guitar dealer had come to where we were rehearsing. I'd always wanted a red semi-acoustic because of Johnny and Smith's, right? Didn't know anything about this. I don't, well, I don't know what that is. And uh, he just came, this guy just came to the rehearsals and the minute I picked it up, it just, I can get my hand all the way around that. If you feel that neck, right, it is like a child's neck. Oh, word. Oh, thank you. Check that out. Oh, yeah. So that's a 1960. It's 60, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. So one day, I've got off tangent here, but it's part of the story. So one day I'm in Paris and obviously I've, I've had this guitar for ages. Listen to it ring. This is, a, honestly, this is one of the best guitars forever. It never goes out of tune. And I, the thing when I'm talking about the Bigsby is just where you can, you know, you play and you can work that, you know, you don't even have to play it and you can kind of, it's, you don't have to strum it because someone else is doing the strumming on the other side of the stage. So you're just kind of adding the soup to it. So one day I'm in Paris in La Pigalle and I'm in the guitar shop. There's one of these hung up. I'm like to the fellow, oh wow, there's another one, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I end up buying this guitar and taking it to the sound check. And I've already got this one. And this is in the late, late nineties. Uh, my guitar tech at the time, uh, for insurance purposes, let's take down the serial number, and he recognised that the one I just bought was the next one along from this. Oh. Right? So we did a ah. we did a bit of digging around, right? And they were made on the same day, right, by two different fellas in Gibson, and they couldn't have been any more different as guitars. They wow. were one. This is like one of my children i won't go anywhere i mean i need to keep it in the studio now because gibson have cloned these and the gibson ones are as good as it gets so this just stays in here now but this other one it was fucking awful <laughs> it was dreadful <laughs> yeah the bigsby was shite the neck was shit the tuners were horrible no matter what i did to it i just i couldn't get a tune out of it at all and it's so mad that Back, well, that's not back in the days when it's, it's guys. I think they call them a Friday afternoon guitar. Right, okay. Where they want to get off early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I had, I had, I had uh, consecutive serial numbers of these two, and this is just incredible. And um, the other one was horrible. But when Gibson were cloning this one, I had them down here, and they were saying, All right, so the thing is, um, how close do you want it to yours? And I was like, 
you've asked me. Yeah. I'd ask you. So they were like, the thing is though, it's such an odd neck. We don't think anybody would be able to play it. And I was like, right. And they said, so would it, would it, can we put an extra bit of girth on the neck? <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't want to clone it. You're not, you know, anyway, I understood what he was saying because that neck is far. I mean, it's far mm. out. It's mad. Mm. It's mad, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna quickly Google how big Noel Gallagher is. I know he's kind of a smallish dude. I'm gonna Google his height. Gallagher height. Oh, he's 5'9". He's literally, I, I, we're the same size yeah. as Noel Gallagher is. Interesting. So, I mean, I, I know I do have, uh, I don't have the biggest hands in the world, but they're not the smallest. So, uh, but I've also seen in, random internet memes of uh we're, we're talking about king charles's sausage hands but we're not talking about noel gallagher's baby feet <laughs> maybe he just has small hands i don't know maybe you know and it's interesting because i mean someone that i remember in in high school when i took guitar right guitar class and oh, you did yeah yeah and like to, like to read the music and the notes and stuff yeah, 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 yeah. And, and it was all classical guitars. So, like, mm -hmm. the wide neck, the nylon strings. Oh, yeah. Dude, oh, yeah. that was killer. Yeah. I was like, the hell? Like, how do I? Like, I was like, this is so uncomfortable. Yeah. You know? And and just that, the fact that he's saying, oh, it's they're super thin. Because you see these guys use their thumbs and all that kind of crazy. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Well, uh, you guys, you know, you see them use your thumb. I'm like, how that can't you can't do that on like a classical, it's hard as shit to do it on a classical, yeah, it's impossible. I, and so, the fact that they have guitars with like smaller necks, like less, I guess, girthier stocks, or I, I, I guess that's a stock or neck, I guess it's a neck, uh, neck, right? neck, neck, uh, less and, girthier um, neck, yeah. And that would that sounds like anything's possible at that point if you can access the guitar. On both sides, you just opened up a whole racket. It makes it easier, it makes it more yeah. at least more pleasant. Right, right, and, and so every guitarist that does what they do just needs to find the one that fits them. Yeah. You know, it's not a one size fits all thing. You it's know, just thing to hear that that it's yeah. not like just the common person. It's like even up on that level, on that tier of musicianship, they're like, hey man, this just fits. Why? Because it's different. It's made for, I guess, a smaller hand. Yeah, it's made for me. Yep. For people like me. Yep. So, so that's cool. Yeah. Oh. But this is honestly. Feedback is quite, it's quite out of order on that. <laughs> it's because I'm so too near to it. But I, 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 I used to love the way Neil Young used to do it. Yeah. yeah. With the feedback. Yeah. And I kind of, that's what I got into. And this guitar has got the best tone. I mean, I, I wrote little by little on this and play, but it's on every, every Oasis record from 96 onwards, everything. And all my solo records, all of them, it's the it's the main rhythm electric guitar. Did you when you were doing uh, the big gigs then, and you were met, and you were doing using the feedback and everything? Did you get to a point where you knew, like, kind of how far you needed to be yeah. away from your amps, and you get the points that would be certain frequencies? Yeah, and... because I never had it through the monitors. Yeah, because I remember because the stages, but when it didn't seem to matter in the early days, because. The monitors, you would drown the monitors out anyway, but the bigger the stages got, you would be two separate sounds. Yeah, right. And they'd be like, fuck, I'm fucking, I want the fuck, that's too weird. I remember it was some big gig and I just said to the guy, switch it off. And he was like, wow. And I was like, just turn it off. And then I was like, that's it. Right. You know, it's the sound of the band on stage. 
And I'll give you an example. I went, I went, I'd never seen the Rolling Stones until I went to see them at the O2 about just the year they were running up to play Glastonbury. And I went out front and I was like, I, I was shocked at how fucking, fucking terrible it was, right? Oh. But then about six weeks later, I was privileged enough to stand on stage at Glastonbury and watch them and it was outrageous. Oh, really? Just the sound of the band. So you're at the mercy of the sound engineer. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, my thing was, let's take that out of the equation. It's like, don't you EQ my It's like, this is, this is what I'm listening to. And, you know, and I stood on the side of the stage and honestly, they were incredible. And that's why, that, that was my thing. It was like, I want to play with the sound of the band yeah. and the feel of the band. And um, I've never understood people who, I've seen thousands of guitarists and people in my band fuck around with monitors for, uh, fucking up with us, just like switch it off, turn it off. But um, you've got to be a little bit mad to do that in a stadium. And, and, and but that's the way they did it in the 60s. There was no yeah. monitors, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and absolutely. it's the way you learn. I think it's the way, I think it's the way you learn how to be in a band, to play yeah. with other people in yeah. a band. And doing small gigs, I've been to like, you know, when Stacy does his rock gigs and all that and been to Ronnie Scott's and stood in and got up and actually just playing with a band close, you know, and, and not, and not, monitors are fucking dreadful things. In-ear monitors are awful. It's ruined my solo career. Um, <laughs> but there is an art to it, mm. definitely. Mm. Um, seeing as you mentioned the solo. Wow. Like. <laughs> how much he hates monitors <laughs> is crazy. just making this for me. I mean, that's crazy because, I mean, he brings up a valid point and that's me just hearing him not knowing anything about being in a band, you know, or how important a monitor is or isn't. I, I could, But the fact that he's saying all this stuff and knowing his track record and knowing how far he's come and the different changes he's had is it's still amazing to hear him say no fuck monitors like it's crazy <laughs> yeah and his story about the rolling stones like uh, uh one of their own tour gigs versus glastonbury like like it, it drives home the point that a sound guy is everything to a live gig not even even a bad even not even the rolling stones can overcome a bad sound engineer <laughs> they're all oh, lions are all equal in that regard mm. Mm. <laughs> career then we've got a giant board in front of us here i think dan and i always surprised when we see a big board like this but then that's because it's on a giant stage right no so I would say Dan made me a board like about five or six years ago and I was, it was great, but he refused, right? He refused. I said to him, mate, the thing is though, when I'm, when I'm playing, I'm kind of, I'm doing a dance, right? I don't want to think about it. I was going, you couldn't make your knobs any bigger, could you? And he said, no. And I was like, I was like, okay, be like that then. I, okay. I only fucking wrote Wonderwall. <laughs> And uh, so I, oh, I, I, don't, I don't specifically remember yeah. that conversation. Well, but, uh, I, well anyway. I do. <laughs> I think Dan's going to go home and get the later. No, well, actually. that pedal board is Gem uses that now, and he loves it because right. he he sits there and he's. I can't I can't do that. But the reason well, this just, is the reason this is so big is this. It's got a mic stand in the middle of it for yes. a start. Yeah. And I have to be able to do this without. Oh Jesus! Without without thinking about it. Sure. Yeah. So we start rehearsing now in. Is it next week? Next week. And I, I just call it the dance, particularly if you're singing yeah. without thinking about it. So, so it's very spread out. I'll admit it's not very compact. And that's because I, I, I just don't want to think about it. I don't want to have to be looking and playing and singing at the same time. Sure. It's just yeah, like, yeah. you know. Um, but the pedals that I've that I use the most or have done since I've gone solo is I never ever used a compressor in Oasis ever. I didn't, I didn't know what, I still don't know, right, <laughs> what they do. Can you explain to me what ratio means? People have tried okay. and I've always <laughs> gone, okay, whatever. <laughs> okay. 
So, right. See, this is where I switch off and just go, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really yeah, not. Come on. <laughs> so, okay. so, single goes in, yeah. right? And it's at a, at a specific level. You've got a threshold, and the threshold says when it gets above this level, uh -huh. I'm going to turn it down. Right. The ratio is how much it turns oh. down. So if you can, if it's a half ratio, it's turned down by half. Right. With three quarters, it turned down by three quarters. Right. The best it was ever explained to me was by Paul Stacey. I was like, what? Well, I've got one of those Cali compressors, right? They're right. And they're amazing. We use them for the studio, but I don't use them live because they're too mad. Uh, this is, and I and I said to him, what? And he just said, just put everything at one o'clock. And I was like, right, well, fucking hell, somebody would say that on the internet. Just put everything at one o'clock. <laughs> but that Keeley, that Keeley compressor is, I've used that ever since I went solo, and I found it very, it was simplified mm. in the sense that when everything's at new, you know, whenever, whenever, when all the buttons are at a certain kind of thing, that's, you know, it starts at 50%, and sure. that is very, very easy to work. So I use that a lot now, and that, Page the Kingsley Boost is one of the best pedals Absolutely. in the history of music. It is not on, it's on everything I've ever recorded since the day it came out. And that guy, I've seen interviews with him, and I've got the I've got the Jester and I've got a few of his pedals oh, are really? brilliant. That is just, a, it's a mad with boost pedals in it because they they're now they're such a thing and they're just like they're part. Of the, if I'd have known all this 30 years ago, that's how good we'd have been then. <laughs> we'd have been amazing. Um, and then... It's just so funny to hear him say, imagine how good we would have been then. Yeah. I'm like, uh, icon of the 90s? Uh, yeah. I, I, that's why, that's another reason I love him so much. He's humble about yeah. that type of thing. I mean, it's not humble about the... Uh, uh, the accolades, especially at the time, he's like, no. oh, I got three stalkers, I got half a million quid in the bank, <laughs> yeah. I've got a Rolls Royce, am I happy with that? No, I'm not! I want more! <laughs> oh, is that, man. Is that Noel Gallagher or Howard Dean? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, can't take us anywhere. Oh, man. There's a Pete Cornish uh soft sustain which as you can see has got paul stacy's name on it Indeed. because he 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 well that was his <laughs> possession <laughs> that was of the law is. and i got one i got one made and it didn't sound as good as his right. and i said borrow me that pedal while i go on tour and he said okay then and then i've just never given it back to him and every time he comes here he's like am i ever getting that pedal back and i'm like no, and, and I say to him, there's not a night that I don't look at your fucking name on top of that pedal, right? <laughs> and just think, he's never getting that pedal back. <laughs> but I gave him mine, and uh, but it's, it's an amazing... I didn't know what it was until somebody said it's a fuzz pedal. Mm. Um, and that's for all... That is, I, I'll kick that in for... I've had that all the way through Oasis from whenever they were made. Or, um, that was all the guitar solos was for lives on that wow. i can ne i can never get i've never used it in the studio but to do solos with it live is amazing and then there's this the greatest delay pedal of all time dd3 the dd3 i have that that was i have that uh, i've had that that pedal i have had for 20 years and that was at nebworth wow. it was because when the space echoes started, so you yeah. were at the mercy of space echoes packing up, I started to use that. And uh, a photographer friend of mine has got a picture of the empty stage at Nebworth before we walked on. And I've got a piece of plywood, right? Nebworth, right? Biggest gigs of all time at that time. I've got a piece of plywood that's about that big and it's got a boss chromatic tuner on it, right? And, a, and that. And that's it, right? Fantastic. To a quarter of a million people, right? That was it. And thought nothing of it, right? Like, didn't I was like probably a little bit pissed off that I had to have something on stage. It's like, can you know, and my text going, and what would I tune her for? So I tune your guitar off. I was like, well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> why are you here? And he's like, yeah, but you can do it yourself. Like, but why am I paying you, paying you to tune the guitars? But you can't go wrong with that. 
I mean, yeah. I've got hundreds of delays, and they're all great. The Strymon timeline is amazing. That's more of a soundscaping yes. thing, studio thing. But I do use it. I do use it live. Mm. There's, a, there's a set in there that says melt. It's, it's more, more like a synth thing, and it's got the most beautiful. I mean, those guys at Strymon are. Everything. I mean, yeah, yeah. just yeah. But there's something about the DD3 yeah. that is just perfect. Yeah. It's got. So, I don't know what it is. The equalizer. I when I'm chopping between humbuckers and single okay. coils, it kind of instead, you know, it just it takes all. It makes one of them. It makes them both sound similar. Right. Okay. Um, so that's what that's for. And then I always struggle with this side of the pedal board because I don't really need it. Right. Okay. So there'll always be. I mean, I need that. Mm -hmm. And then what I always find if I'm I'll I'll need that because I'll do little by little the tremolo. There's the tremolo thing on it. What I always find is no matter what tour I'm doing, or no matter what set list I've got, there's always one spare thing that I don't know what to do with. And I try, I drive him mad over there. I go, I'll put a thing on it. And he'll like, this gets label gun out and label it again. I'll put another thing on it. I'm going to do another thing. And I just, I just, I never use them live. I kind of, I'm still into that. The, in, the, in the headspace where I was when I was in, Oasis, like poor Gem, right? Has got one of your pedal boards. It's like fucking Cape Canaveral, right? <laughs> Honestly, he's got like a billion pedals on it, and he's forever fanning around in sound checks. And I walk past him, going, "You know what, I mate?" Mean? And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, just, just a minute, just a minute." And um, he, 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 when he, when he, you know, when we're doing records, he'd be like, "Fuck, I'm gonna get another pedal now." You know, he's got hundreds of pedals on his pedal board, bless him. But he doesn't have to sing, so you know, what else is he gonna do? <laughs> um, but. Yeah, the, I mean, the Mobius, I've, uh, you know, I felt I should have some kind of chorus okay. when I was making New Built the Moon. Right. I, don't think, I don't think I ever put it on. Right. I think it's just there because it looks good. I don't know. And the, and the Empress, that echo system does a particular thing. It's like it does a, a choppy delay thing and, and a and pitch shift at the same yes. time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just use that for... For nothing, I mean, I don't even need a pedal board. I don't even know why I've got one, <laughs> you know. But I've, but, I, but I have got one. But um, and it's a particularly lovely one. Um, well, it's Mike, Mike, it's Mike Hill yeah. board, who's sadly not with us anymore. Yeah. And um, well, that's been, yeah, that's been. A, this has been all over the world for me. And it's like I'm so used to the, to the way that the, the way the that, out, yeah, just yeah. the way the, the way that they feel yeah. underneath your, underneath your feet. Mm -hmm. That I couldn't, I couldn't do anything without it, um, and I've got a few of them, and some of them, some of them, I've got like a one that's half size on for when I, when I do guests with other people or small or a TV one or something, but, um, yeah, if if, if uh, yeah, if I was strictly just a guitarist, I'd be so in, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be way more into it than I am, you know, I'd have, I'd have pedals for miles, and why wouldn't you? We're living in the golden age Indeed. now. Is the amp approach similar for high flying birds? No, what 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 are you? I use that. So uh, we're looking at a custom a high watt custom fifty. Yeah, I I I've always when I went solo the the the, so, the, the tone of the guitar started to clean up. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's not it's not as rock, and I never really. I never I never I could never find any. I didn't have anything that I had. Um, from the Oasis days. I had this high watt uh, combo, it's a 100 watt combo that they made me, and it was a vertical stack. It's unique. They tried to clone it hundreds of times me because, and it was a one-off, and I used to have to ship it everywhere. And it was one of those amps where it's like, I've got to get myself away from this amplifier, right. because if I don't, it's going to be the death of me. And I was watching this is why YouTube now is amazing. And you know the Australian guy with the little... Brett, thing, I don't know what he's... Yeah. yeah. So he was doing a thing on these high watt custom 50s. <laughs> and why on earth I'm in the back of a taxi listening to it on my phone thinking, <laughs> this would be a good idea. This sounds fucking great. <laughs> Listen to it. It sounds great. <laughs> it's like it's coming through a speaker the size of a thumbnail. And um, so I got, I got a couple of them. I wouldn't you know it. It just it just suited everything that I was doing, yeah, and again, it's another it's another thing. I rarely use them in the studio. You know, there's two separate 
I always treat when to, the live thing and the studio thing as two completely separate worlds. I will never, ever, ever try and recreate anything from the studio on the stage. Oh, wow. it's, it's complete. But my experience, when I have people working for me and they're like, what do you use on the record? I'm like, forget it. We're not, we're not here. We're not here to reproduce the record. Even when we start rehearsing next week, everybody will enter into it trying to play the record. Right. And then I'll always point saying, we're not, we're not playing the record here, we're doing a gig. So it's not, we either have to simplify this or straighten it out because no one's listening to it as a record. It's an emotional fucking night between you and the crowd. So I don't like, I don't like to try and reproduce everything because it's got to sound good on stage. Sure. If it sounds good in this, they sound honestly amazing on yeah. stage and I wouldn't, wouldn't go on tour without them. But I've never used them in the studio. My main amp when I'm in here is, I've got a, seven, a 1971 Fender Vibralux, which is great for the clean Fender thing. And then I've just bought a 63 Baseman, which is just, I mean, Beautiful. without doubt, the greatest amp ever made. You know, it's got everything, but they're so, I wouldn't say fragile, but they're so important to the studio. I would never, yeah. I would never take them out of here. Yeah. And it's like this guitar, it's too important to me now to take out on the road. And if the other ones, yeah, you know, someone says, oh, it's not, well, it's good enough. Do you know what I mean? Because if this ever got, I've had a couple of guitars get damaged on the road, like headstocks falling off them and that, and it's like, kills me, you know, but, um, yeah, I, ne I, ne I never try and recreate albums on stage. Mm. You know, it's a passing, it's a performance, isn't it? It's a passing thing. It's not like, oh, you went there. Oh, it didn't sound like the record. Mm. It's not like I wasn't supposed to, yeah. you know. And, and again, I wouldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't, apart from definitely maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe it's a thing I should look into, apart from definitely maybe, Oasis never recorded live ever, ever once. It was all, it was, Everything we ever did, apart from definitely maybe, all of Morning Glory started with me and a click track on an acoustic guitar. And everything was built. Wow. So, like, before he gets into that, like, this is one of the longest times we've gone without pausing yeah. for this one. Because I'm just, I'm, I'm enamored by it's... his pedals, his uh, amplifiers, th talk about what he uses. Like, this is just time to absorb information right here. Yeah. And he, uh, he may make a good point of, you know, you don't go to see a band to hear their record. You hear to, you know, a great song is a great song, no matter what the individual sounds are. Those are just, you know, the uh, uh, bedroom nerds that, uh, that can't give a shit about this stuff. And they're most likely not at the gig I anyway. So, yeah. And it goes to yeah. the point of what he was saying earlier, like there are certain chords, but it matters what you put on top of them yep. and that the melodies and stuff and lyrics. That's what, uh, that's what gets the common everyday folk. And, you know, you obviously try and get it sounded close to how it is on the record and, or just being able to play it live. But I would be remiss. Like, I feel like, I feel like I'd be cheated a little bit if it sounded exactly like the record in terms of like my favorite uh artists in a in a, a concert i would i would say the same thing i think his head's in a very unique and very I, I i like i like what he's saying about the live and the studio versions of things you know yeah i i, I agree i'm going to agree with him on on all of what he just said about that you yeah. know yeah. and how it's it's an experience how each you know, it's kind of like each each gig is like a, a, a fingerprint. Each one is yeah. unique for different reasons. Right, and right. they don't need to sound exactly the same. So Right. It would be a bad if they did, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's real real humans making real music, and hopefully it is. I mean, yeah. um, not, you know, it, you know that it's real. Like, yeah. it's no, no backing tracks, no nothing like that. And... I will say the next segment here is recording to a click. And I remember hearing this story, like how Dave Grohl almost got kicked out of Nirvana because he wouldn't play drums to a click track. Yeah. Uh, like Butch Vig, who was producing Nevermind, almost kicked him out. He's like, hey, we could get someone else in here. Like, 
I know you're accurate. You're pretty accurate most times, but play to a click. You're, you'll be, it'll be much more of a difference. And Dave did play to a click and he was, he was, his mind was changed like, like that hmm. and made history. So let's, let's see what Noel has to say about that. Let's just back it up a little bit. There we go. Here we go. And everything was built on top of that. No way. Every single wow. thing we ever did. Huh. And how we fell into that was, because we never did any demos. Obviously, because doing different way, we were in a rehearsal yeah. room and that, yeah. that was the sound of it. But no one had heard the songs when we got into def to, to do Morning Glory. Mm. So, Owen, uh, so we're just going to play it in there and I would just play it and, and kind of sing it. And then we just developed this method of, I would do it to a click track. So what I do now is, so I'll have a, I'll play it into a mic a few times. Callum will be sat in there and he'll just set an average pace to it. And then when I start speeding up from the click, we'll stop it and then speed the click up to whatever you're speeding up to. So it feels natural and then go back and then do it. So it never sounds like it's played to a click because you're naturally speeding up yeah, yeah, for that at the first yeah, chorus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he'll realize it's sped up two BPM. Then you go back and you speed that bit up at two BPM and then keep it there until you feel like it should slow down again. So it's a case of getting the click tap right and all the movement in it, and then going to play it. And it takes, uh, but it, it's easier for me as a songwriter because I, in the Oasis days, I would put the thing down with the guide vocal and then sit in the control room and say, right, how's this going to take shape? Instead of five guys bashing away loud as fucking just like, and then going, that's it. And think, well, that's, yeah, not, yeah. that's, that's actually not what I wanted it to sound like. So those songs were fully formed mm. when you when you laid those parts down. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you work out, okay, where you wanted to go and then yeah, start yeah, laying yeah. things top. Can you imagine? Wow. Champagne Supernova is eight minutes long. I had to play that without singing it, right? Just to a click. And I'd never done a demo and no one had ever heard it. And all the band are in the control room and I'm going... For eight minutes and everyone's like, what is that fucking song? And I'm like, what it is, is epic. It is. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's something that I, I feel, I feel way more comfortable doing it like that. Mm. And when I tell kids, fans, and they, you know, how do you do it and all that, and I tell them, they're blown away by it. Yeah. They're like, but how? I mean, you've got to know the song inside out. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to know it. By the time I get into the studio, I've had the songs for a year, right? right? Yeah. And I know them inside out. Yeah. I know all, I never use a lyric sheet. I know all the words on it. I know everything yeah. when I get it. So I know exactly what I'm doing. And um, yeah, you have to know the song inside out and, and feel when you're speeding up. And then there's an art to it because then you know, I cannot bear doing take after take after take. I, I will, he'll tell you over the, I just, if I haven't got it in three, I'm going home. Most of the vocals that I do, just one take, wow. you know, and it's not, and that's not a, hey man, it's one take, yeah. you know, it's just like, I know it. So well, I know how to sing yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. It's in there. And, um, you've done all the work beforehand. Yeah. 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 All the, all the, and it's, it's, it's the, it's the McCartney thing, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if the studio clock is ticking, you know, you, you, you better know the tunes when you get in there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Champagne Supernova, some might say, roll with it, and Morning Glory, all those we've done to, if you break it all down, um, maybe one day we'll get the masters and it'll just be just me and a guitar with loads of geezers in the control room going, what's this one called? Know. But that was the funny thing about Morning Glory, no one had heard the songs mm -hmm. until I rocked up into the studio. And that was it, you know. So one of the th one of the things Yeah, I, I agree with his mindset about it. Like if I can't sing one of my songs, you know, in my sleep, you know, at a gig without looking at uh words or anything, it's it's not ready to bring to the studio. Mm. Like I recorded a uh full band version of the first day and um I mean it took a little bit to get the guitar parts, but like like guitar solos, that that type of thing. But the vocal one take there you like, go one take wonder and all this was left to do after my part was done was 
make, make some uh, drum uh, parts, and that's that was it. There you go. In and out right. in two hours. Saved me money, saved me time, and it's a great product. I can't wait to share with y'all later this uh, year or next year. I, I, I like for real. Like it. That's how it should be. You know. Yeah. Like uh, studio is not a place to hang out. Studio places. The studio is a place to get work done and get out. Yeah. You should. Exactly. You should have your shit hammered out before you touch the studio. Right. Right. Um, that's certainly the case with guitar based music or like definitely with hip hop, uh, producers, like they get the posse there and like the real, the real ones, like, you know, they'll either have something on their phone to a beat and they'll do a couple of takes to get the, um, uh, the flow just right. Like, at least that's what, uh, uh, Rick Rubin talked about one time when they was making Jay-Z's 99 problems. Like, uh, he had the, uh, the beat uh, and he came in, JC came in, did like three goals of it just to get the flow right. And after three, he had got it. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. Things I wanted to, to mention quickly, um, what, a couple of very fond memories I have when, during that period of time and during the, who built the moon, uh, was in the studio with you and David Holmes mm. and doing some playback. And and I'm like, that. What are those keys? They sound amazing. And Dad was like, No, no, that's, that's no playing yeah. through through the rig. Yeah. And some of the some of the sounds on that were, you know, you were really getting into those and just mm. just creating these yeah. sonic things. Yeah. He t he turned me on to that. Um, you know, he was like, Bring as many pedals as you can. And I'd never, I'd, I'd I know, I'd never, I know, I know a guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd never, uh, I'd never made a record like that. But um, yeah, when people say, "Oh man, it's just electronic record," it's like it's all guitars. Yeah. It's just all yeah. the pedals, you know. And he, he, we would just buy pedal. We have bought thousands of pedals on that album sessions. But for example, another track, "Black Star Dancing." Yes. That thing that starts the da 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 da. That's on the hologram, um, the holo is it called a hologram pedal? Yeah, it's yeah, a hologram pedal. Yeah. Honestly, I had, a, I had one of those um, Black Stratocasters, the Edge signature one, right. one of the best guitars ever played in my life. It's a fucking beautiful guitar. And it's the first setting on the first thing. <laughs> and I hit this chord and it just went da 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 da. And it's one of those moments where you go, press record now. <laughs> Do it now, and there'll be someone in there going, I'm gonna come to the fucking thing. It's just like, I swear to God, do it now. No, oh, you've made a fucking idiot. And uh, you managed to capture it, and the whole song was built around, around that. that. Amazing. You know, and in um, for It's a Beautiful World, where uh, Charlotte, the, the, the girl speaking in French, that's all built around that hologram effects thing. And, that, mm. and I, there's one thing I love about these Strymon and stuff and these big pedals is I fucking love a preset. I cannot be asked getting my own sounds. It's just like that. Some guy slaved over that yeah, in right. Utah, right? <laughs> for 16 months to get that sound. I'm not going to take a bit of top off it. With respect for the man. You know, <laughs> I strive and stuff. It's just I'm like, dude, do you not want to escape your own sounds? I'm like, no, I don't. Written the songs, is that not enough? I've got to come up with the own sounds now. You know, uh, <laughs> I love presets and I love nicking other people's settings. Right. Um, what 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 I think that is not shown enough on these YouTube videos that that you know the Andertons ones and yours and all that they never just say what the settings are on the amp because I'm playing through a fucking da 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 and a little there with a fucking EL7 you can fucking list every valve known to man but fucking hell where's the fucking treble yeah, yeah. you know list every microphone you want it's an EL78 through a 94.2 with a dot and a wobble on it and yeah but what Where's the presents? You know, is it on six? I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Two hundred thousand pedal show viewers just went. Told you. <laughs> yeah, because I just I'll be watching them and thinking, but I wonder what the settings are right. on the on the amp itself. Because you you see them all on the on the pedals, but on the amps themselves, um, I'm forever nicking people's settings. Mm. Forever. I remember when I went. I did the thing recently. Um, uh, the Royal Festival, all for Peter Blake's 80th 
90th birthday party, the birthday party. and uh, it was me, well, and Madness, The Who, blah, blah, blah. and uh, a couple of nights before, that mess of boogie amp had turned up from Gibson, mm -hmm. and um, the guys come in and said, oh, there's only two in the world, there's only two in, in the UK, and one's for you, and I was like, oh, great, and they get to uh, the festival hall, and there's one of these amps, and it's Pete Townsend's got the other one, right? <laughs> so I oh. said to Nick, I was going, go on, Nick, he's fucking saying and he was like, go on then. So he said, wait till his tech was looking. He was like, travels on six. And I was like, write it down. And I was like, because he's one of the most underrated guitarists oh, that's ever been. He's amazing. And he's unique in a way, because he's actually one of the best songwriters that's ever been as well. And uh, I was like, I, I said to him, I'd make of that amp. He's going, well, I don't know. It's just got it. It's white, you know. And I was like, um, well, yeah, I was, remember one night me, when me, we were playing, Oasis playing with Neil Young in Paris. And, uh, nice. you know, like you think of, I mean, he's one of the, forget it, right? Yeah. Just yeah. forget it, right? There's nothing you can say about him that's adequate enough to express what a fucking punk rock he is. And Oasis were opening up for him, right? And uh, after his sound check, me and Gem kind of, it's like, I think he'll let us on stage and have a look at his guitars. And literally, they were all just lying. No guitars, they were just lying on the fucking, just beside his amps. And uh, his guitar crew, they were amazing. They were going, oh, yeah, just look at the pedal board. And it was like the like a fucking junk shop yeah. of stuff. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm forever trying to nick people's vibes. <laughs> I haven't got the patience for it because I'm a, because I, I, now. I love that attitude about him. He's like, like this person slaved over this pedal. To make this sound, I'm not going to change it. He worked so hard on it. I love that. And I, I like, like how it's like he's lazy a little bit, but I love that. It makes him relatable down yeah. to earth. Yeah. The every man's rock, rock and roll star. Like, like come on, ah, man. Dude. I love it. The, the, um, that reminds me, and I'm not trying to, I, I had to say because recently, what was that that Auburn guy, right? <laughs> the gorillas, yeah. you know, and 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 blur. It's like the setting. It's a presetting. It's a presetting on a machine. That that what was it? What was that song? He just hit it, and it's there. It is. It's already made. The song was already made. Um, no idea. Oh my god. Yeah. But feel good ink. No, not feel good ink. I'm happy. Feel that 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 one. Oh, oh, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. That's a presetting on a machine comes out of the factory hit it and he just added stiff stuff to that to make that yeah. song and it's just like it's just interesting it's like he he's because he's busy trying to write trying to create it's like i don't need to make the sounds <laughs> right like, i right. love that though yeah it's really yeah trouble. and it, it, it's like you know he's been accused of you know ripping off a bunch of other songs which he did you know but yeah, the thing about that is all the great songs aren't written, they're rewritten. Yeah. Just like, you know, movies, TV shows, things like that. And I I remember a little bit earlier in this video, like right near the beginning, I when he was talking about the Marshall and the Wen amp and how the treble was turned all the way up. It's like I knew that. I knew that it was very it was a very trebly sound instead of a very like low end bass sound. Hmm. Uh of of the uh definitely maybe record so i was like yes i'm right about that <laughs> you're just donald you're like yep sure like, bro sure don't bro. even know what you're talking about but i'm glad <laughs> i'm happy for you that you picked that up <laughs> I, like i said you're the one you're the one this is this is your language i am yep. just appreciating it and and i see them as three human beings that produce <laughs> words out of their mouth so yeah. i'm here for it though Talk rock and roll. Yep. I've accepted over the last maybe five years. I'm like, no, hang on a minute. Fuck this. I'm a, I'm a writer. Yeah. I write. That's what I do. I'm not slaving away, you know, worrying about it anymore. I'll just get someone else to. That's why I've got another guitarist. So other guitarists, bless them. But, you know, I will steal your vibe. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch the Get Back thing? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't, want to. don't you find it amazing, right, that in 1969, 
So the Beatles are playing and all the guitars. Remember the bit where George's guitar just falls over? Yeah. They look at it. No one had the wherewithal to invent the <laughs> guitar stand. <laughs> no one's bothered to go, hey, you know, it'd be a fucking good idea. I would put them on a stand. Why don't I think of that? The Beatles. <laughs> I love that bit where he's playing with the wah wah and McCartney's going, yeah, I'm not really sure. Not, not, not really sure. And just getting increasingly <laughs> chewy with him having the yeah. wah wah. But he's obviously got it because Hendrix and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the thing. That was the thing. Yeah. But um, I, do you know what? What I, what I loved about the get back thing was I've been saying since the day. I understood what the Beatles were. I was like, they're not wizards. They're four fucking scousers trying to make a tune, right? Yep. So when 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 they're talking about, you know, when they're going, Run on us a man from Tucson. Hey, it's, it's Tucson in Arizona. <laughs> I think it is. Oh, great, that fits. And then George trying to write a song and they're saying, just be the first thing that comes into your head. I'm going, see? Yeah. See, they're not fucking sitting around like, you know, with quills going, I don't know, like <laughs> strawberry fields. And I was like, just fucking four lads in a band yeah. making it up as they go along yeah. and it was amazing to see it yeah that's what songwriting is it's yeah. just you're, you know you're at you, something is happening you don't know what it is but you know it's there and you've just got to persevere with it and i've always likened it to just going fishing you know the fit that you know the life of the fisherman is kind of like he's in this thing and he's to catch up some days you don't catch anything yeah, yeah you know some days you land a big one you know and that's 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 how I feel about songwriting. It's just, it's like, you know, that you have to be there every single day. You know, you have to be there. Because mm. the day that the one arrives, you know, is, is a great day. And then you get little ones along the way that might add up a bit from this, might add on to that, and you might get a tune out of it. You still get that buzz? It's the best. It's what I got out of bed in the morning for. Mm -hmm. It's what I got out of bed in the morning for. And yeah, I just want to say real quick, uh, it's. I didn't see all of Get Back. I mean, I saw little bits and pieces of it just through social media. But you know, the fact that, you know, they came up with those songs just like right then and there is like, they're not gods. They're just regular people making a tune. They're just the first one uh, that made it big doing it, doing so. Like before that ever, nobody wrote their own stuff. And the Beatles are just the first ones. And they're now judged by that's the standard of every uh, songwriter and every popular musician. Now that's, that's it. Yeah. They're just the first ones that, that got famous to win it. That's yep. it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, they're just this, like, I like, like what he said, they're just regular fucking people. Yeah. Yeah. This yep. humanizes the whole thing. Yep. I, I love touring and I'm about to go on a, you know, a big, world tour for a couple of years and I love it it's the final payoff right you know it's the kind of just you don't really get to know well, my records out in June the second and I've been doing a promo tour now where I'm talking about it for the last six weeks I don't know nothing I won't know anything about this record until midway through this tour and that's when you that's when you understand what it's because that's when you understand what other people are getting from it right. so you'll start off by playing five songs from it within about six weeks two of those have been gone because they're not moving the crowd and you think maybe that's not that's not as good as i thought it was and then you put another one in and that does something so you don't really get to know about the record that you've made until a year into it wow. because you know you're, you're an artist and you sit here walking around thinking i am great i really fucking am but actually They'll let you know. Yeah, when you're wow. It. They'll let you know. Council Skies, everyone. Yes, Check indeed. Check out in June. Oh, yeah. uh, new album from Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. Yes. Uh, Featuring you... your good mate and guitar supplier, Johnny Ma. Johnny Ma and, and, and Paul Stacey oh. plays bass on a couple of tracks. He's, he's a brilliant bass player. He's amazing. He's a yeah, brilliant. Yeah. He's one. He's a very, very good bass player. I love his bass playing. And um, he plays some great, great guitar on it and uh, Johnny obviously is just I mean yeah but um yeah it's very guitar it's, it's it's a guitar heavy record without being that you know indie rock thing and you've uh, done it all here right in your studio I we mixed it here yeah and funnily enough Callum who's the engineer he did he 
he was halfway through mixing it before he realized he was mixing it because we were doing we were doing the, the monitor mixes and i was taking them home and going i don't know if anyone all i'm going to do is go to some guy he's going to charge me a fortune and i'm going to say to him i want it to sound, sound like this. exactly like this which i've done before <laughs> you know you go into some big mixing studios and they'll say why don't you just use that I'm like actually that's a good idea and uh so we're at, he'd done about four or five tunes and i said to my management we better tell him of course as soon as we told him he shit his pants he was just like i was like saying to him i saw him one afternoon and i was going you ever mixed a record before no i was like you know you're halfway through one <laughs> no oh no 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 let me see it's just like mate it's, it's fucking brilliant just keep doing what you're doing no no <laughs> are you sure and uh yeah so we record yeah recorded every note of it here mixed it here and um it was it's i mean it's a privilege to have your own studio mm. but I, when the, the the clock is not t i mean i only work from 12 to 6 and only ever have done so i get to the studio about 11 have a cup of tea and talk about what we're going to do and any advice i give to anyone is i only attempt two things every day that's it i don't i don't just go in there and go oh well let's have a time we'll try that on the way here um i i work for two things if I can do the guitar on that and the glockenspiel on that and then we're out of here and if you're not I don't as great as studios are and an, an amazing you know, playing music after about six hours I'm like right fuck this yeah. I want to go I want to, I want to go and have something to eat and watch TV for a bit but um it's nice to have a place where the clock is not ticking yeah, yeah. Sure. and uh and you've just and you've you know you've designed itself and you've you know everything that's in here is in here for and you don't have to move anything and everything works and it's all yeah no it's a, it's a special place to be in my band have rehearsed in here and it's big enough it's big enough to get six or seven or eight of us in here so yeah it's been amazing and um yeah i mean the record sounds just incredible yeah, yeah. wonderful can't wait to hear it yeah uh, no, thank you so much oh, Ken, thank you enough yeah. <laughs> this has been incredible i wish i could have i wish i could have done the pedal thing a bit more but I'm, i was like <laughs> i was on the way down i was thinking this is going to be fun this as i'm not really into pedals <laughs> <laughs> i was i was wondering actually as an addendum after we say cheerio maybe we'd get you just switching few or three few things get some sounds going yeah, yeah, yeah. to uh yeah. to to play the good people out but needless to say it's been a trip oh, it's been it a really pleasure. Yeah. thank yeah. you very thank much you so much. thank you wow there you go, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. That's awesome. He's going to let everybody else...
dream come true, man. Right? Best things we've ever checked out. Automatic 10 thumbs up for that one. That was good, that, man. I dug that. Bring it up to 11. Yes, 100%. <laughs> that was good, man. I enjoyed that. Oh, my I God. That. It's just that it's like picking Noel Gallagher's brain. Like, yeah. I've grown to love him through the channel here. But, like, that is, like, like a culmination of everything we've checked out. Of Oasis from, you know, <laughs> all the back catalog, oh. their solo careers, the Oasis Supersonic doc, like, the, uh, ah, ah, yeah. this is what Everything. I needed. This is what I Everything. needed. This was nice, yes. man. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed this a lot, man. This was, it was just so, it was, it was a depth that I wasn't expecting, but I'm yeah. very happy that, um, I don't know, I feel like I connected it with him more than, yeah. because, for some reason, I always thought he was just more of an introvert as far as when it came to Liam, you know. And, right. and I, I liked, I liked his, I liked where his head is at now. You know, mm -hmm. I like what what he said. I like, I definitely agree with him on like nine, like all of it, really. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It was, it was very interesting. To see there's behind there's the a curtain. method to his madness. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I relate to him a lot. Like I my creativity uh type of things and like how i approach life is a lot similar to him like uh liam is a dog i'm uh, noel's a cat and then i'd say that about us i'm i'm like a cat you're like a dog yeah pretty much pretty yeah. much man yeah uh, I, I'm, I'm with that i'm with that 100 percent, man but like yeah. I, I like that it was it was good it's always good to learn and always good to 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 see where people are coming from and what made them and and that, that it this this did a very good job of of painting that picture clearer or making yeah. that picture clearer so i love yeah. that and and it doesn't matter like what genre of music you do me i'm you know country singer songwriter uh type but you know i got a lot from him through you know in terms of like guitars and songwriting and just the approach of sounds yeah. like I, I i i got a lot from that and yeah. i i love and appreciate noel gallagher a lot more now like for the longest time i think we've both been team liam when it comes to the oasis uh coin but i think with this uh in my mind at least noel is gotten back up to uh to liam like yeah like a 51 49 uh, now i'm i'm still i'm still i'm still 80 20. Okay, you know, you're still 80 20. I'm still 80 20, but I appreciate him more. Yeah, but but you were like a 90 10 before, right? Now you're an 80 20. I, I, yeah, yeah, I guess I could, I, I would say that. This is, I, I appreciate him because he he's actually talking about the process that yeah. was like, like the mystical process behind what he did. Now that I know that there are times where he's like, fuck it, let's just see how it sounds. I get mad points for. I give yeah. you mad points for being real and not it's being great punk rock mentality. Yes. You know, just this is how it's supposed to sound. Yeah. And that's and I like that. I like that about that. So yeah, definitely definitely went up a notch for me. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, I'm here for it, man. I'm here for this kind of stuff. This yeah. intrigues me because if anything, yeah. it's it's a professional telling you 
letting you in on trade secrets and 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 kind of what what built the past that sound that is iconic that you associate yeah. with his name and so i yeah. like that yeah same here man that's like to to pull back the curtain a little bit on something that we take for granted like yep. that's a great thing yep. so oh, but at the same time this was the reason we did this was to celebrate a hundred thousand subscribers and pay homage to the people that got us started in the Man. first place the yes. oasis crowd yes if you're still out there guys if you're still out there, that is. <laughs> oh, but, man. And this is the only time we really could do it was the 100,000 uh, yeah. week. Yeah, so, it makes sense to do it. Yeah. So, y'all, thanks for coming on this ride with us. Uh, we yeah. love and appreciate every single one of you. If you're new here, somewhere around now to subscribe and watch another video. I put some of my own music right here. Oh, yes. You Make can check sure it check out. Check that out. Check that out. Yeah. Yes. Either way, wash your hands, scrub your toes, wipe your ass, blow your nose, embrace a suck. Unplug and do something epic, guys. And be mad for it, too. Hell yeah. <laughs> Later. Fellas, we could be that mistake. Let's do this.